Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 5th, 2017 regular meeting of the City of Morro Bay Harbor Advisory Board. We're meeting this evening in Veterans Memorial Hall, or building it is, 209 Surf Street in Morro Bay. So the first uh, item is to uh, establish a quorum and call to order. We are all present this evening. We have a quorum. The Harbor Director is with us and a Lori, what's your formal title? Business, business coordinator. And the business coordinator from the Harbor Department is with us this evening. Thank you. So a moment of silence, please. We have plenty to be silent about, I think, this evening. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so that brings us to chair, advisory board member, and city council liaison announcements and any presentations we have. Um, Mr. Makowetsky, do you have anything this evening? Okay, thank you for being here. Now let's start down. Bill? Yes, I have two, two announcements. Uh, this past weekend we held the uh, Jesse King Memorial Paddle Race. Uh, benefiting the uh, Morro Bay Junior Lifeguards and the friends of the Morro Bay Harbor Department, we were able to raise $1,000. So that was a good thing. Um, thank you, Harbor Patrol, for really doing all the work that you do. Um, second of all, um, Morro Bay Science Explorations is presenting a program, uh, three programs, October 12th, February 8th, and June 14th. October 12th will be on eelgrass, February 8th will be on climate change, and June 14th will be on sea otters. And this is presented by the estuary program. Now I'm not sure if it's, if it's in conjunction with our Morro Bay estuary program, but um, it will be held at the San Luis Obispo Bot Bot Botanical Gardens, and it starts at 6 o'clock. So the first one is October 12th, and it will be on eelgrass, if anyone's interested. Thank you. Dan? Um, Harbor Fest on Saturday, big thing going on here. And uh, in the water, in the background of all the festivities there on the street, there'll be two events going on. We have the survivors, cancer survivors, dragon boat races, and they'll be out kind of out in front of the Yacht Club and along the channel there. And then we also have up by the T Pier, and I'm not sure exactly the course yet, but it'll be the, the uh, Harbor Cup that been, we've been having for a few years. So those are two events that uh, will be going on in the water for the Harbor Fest. Uh, another item I wanted to just bring up, and that was the uh, US Sailing, the governing body for sailing in the United States. Uh, and as far as yacht racing, they have an event called the Championship of Champions. And this is uh, a, a regatta that is for national champions of certain classes. And then they apply, and then there's 15 of them that are chosen. And this year, we have uh, national champions of the Day Sailor Fleet a uh, couple of college students from UCSB that are representing Morro Bay Yacht Club at this event. It's a very prestigious event. I mean, uh, Rolex Sailor of the Year. There's, I mean, it's, the list goes on. There's uh, quite a contention of, of top-notch sailors there. So that starts tomorrow. They flew there yesterday, and they practiced today. <laughs> and uh, that starts tomorrow, and it goes through the weekend, and then they fly back on Sunday. And where is that place? That is in, this year it's in Oyster Bay, New York, and they'll be 
racing sonars. They choose a different boat for all of these people to race um, other than their own craft, their, their own class, and they compete against each other. So they'll be racing against uh, the skipper and crew of the national winners of the J-70 class and the 505 class and all these other classes. So they don't take everybody, they just take 15 uh, applicants. So these were four college students, um, Hayden Stapleton, Rory McClish won the national championships and they're bringing the uh, Cal Poly sailing captain Grace Carrick and the sailing captain from the Gauchos, uh, uh, UCSB, which is number two on the west coast, uh, Hayden, I mean, um, I'm sorry, Sterling Henkin, and uh, they have quite the resume, so it's, it's really something that we even made it to this point. Did I recognize a last name? Uh, yeah, it's a relative of mine. And for those that don't know, what is a sonar, please? A sonar is a 23-foot uh, sloop rig. It's a fixed keel boat, about the size, you know, it's kind of like a J-24, but a little bit different design. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Neil? Okay. Lynn? Um, the bay is just doing fine. Um, the little anchovies that last month were only two or three inches are now maybe three or four inches and there's schools of them. They're doing fine. Um, lots of pelicans are showing up and they're just pooping like crazy. So the bay is doing good. And if someone wanted to harvest some, and if non-commercial folks wanted to harvest some anchovies out of the bay, What's the best way to do that? Years ago, we used to go out in a skiff with a, a light and wait for they to come around the light and we try to scoop them up. Of course, we usually bought a, brought a bottle of wine and some glasses, so we didn't always get all the anchovies, but uh, that was a good way. So, that, that was a number of years ago. Really good eating. Really good eating. Uh, as you can see up on the screen, if AGP will help us, is that is that um, poster live, AGP? There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, October 14th, Saturday evening, and the early, or starting at 5 and ending at 9, is the ninth annual fundraising event for the Community Foundation of Estero Bay. Uh, our Morro Bay Sings event, and this year the musical theme is the Eagles, which will be played by a local band, uh, Cuesta Ridge. The event includes a light dinner um, that's catered by uh, the Galley Restaurant here in town, a live auction with some pretty great stuff, a silent auction with some good stuff, and music uh, periodically along in the evening and a, and a no-host wine and beer bar. It's a great event. All of the money, well, I should say all of the money except for the fees, uh, goes to help uh, children from families uh, who cannot otherwise afford it uh, to play in organized sports in Estero Bay. Uh, that includes the city's uh, recreational division activities, uh, programs and also uh, so South Bay soccer uh, and football uh, on local events and uh, it's a great time and we'd love to have everybody out there and on the dais and everybody come and bring your wallet thank you okay so now we have public comment uh, open public comment for items that are either not on the agenda or for folks who can't stay and um, I we have apparently none so we'll, we'll move right along and that brings us to the consent calendar which is the approval of minutes from the HABS uh, meeting on August 3rd of 2017 and do we have any corrections or comments from the board regarding those minutes? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? I'll make that motion. Need a second? Second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. 
Any discussion? Any further discussion on that? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. So the next one is uh, reports and appearances, item B1, which is the Harbor Department status report. Director Andersby. Thank you and good evening and welcome back to another meeting. Uh, in addition to my usual stuff, I got another stack of things that have come up in the meantime since printing this, so I'll probably start with um, not arguably really the most important, if, if you saw a press release that went out today, um, we've hopefully got a new city manager. Um, Scott Collins has been given a conditional offer of employment um, as our new city manager, has been recruited by current interim city manager Marty Lomelli and our um, recruitment um, consultant. And that offer is contingent, I believe, has accepted it and is contingent upon the city council approving it at their meeting next week. Uh, Mr. Collins is currently the deputy city manager for the city of Santa Cruz, which he promoted into July of last year. And prior to that, since 2011, he was city of Santa Cruz's assistant um, to the city manager. Uh, and before that, he worked as the assistant to the city manager in Boulder, Colorado, and was a manager, management analyst to the city and county of Denver before that. Um, got his degree from UC Santa Cruz in public administration, went to George Washington University. Uh, our department heads met him last week, late last week, and had a little sit down for an hour or so with him and just kind of round table things around. And um, Seems like a nice guy, seems like a great fit. Um, Moving here starting, I think, November 6th tentatively, so hopefully we get a new city manager um, back in place. And we're also, from what I understand, pretty close to getting a finance director, which I can't give you any details on, but we're hopefully going to get some stability there as well. So that's probably the most important announcement. Recent department activity, usual statistics, we had nine emergency responses, 128 calls for service, 27 assists, 90, 29 enforcement contacts and five weather hazards. Pretty busy month. Um, had September 3rd, we assisted a distressed swimmer um, in the middle of the channel of the harbor. They were returned back to the dock from which they came from. Um, later that same day, we had a report of a missing nine-year-old child um, on the beach in the water, last seen in the water, which in the lifeguard world is a pretty much a red alert. Um, lifeguards, harbor patrol, fire, our police and fire all descended upon the area. And fortunately, we were able to find that child within a few minutes. Mostly our beach lifeguards found him. Um, not in distress, as kids often do. He just wandered off and parents didn't see him. So that one turned out well. Um, September 13th, we responded to a skiff on the beach inside the harbor at the South Jetty. Um, it was pretty well full of sand and water, dewatered it, pulled it off, and um, towed its wet owner back to where he came from, wet owner and passenger. So nobody harmed there. Unfortunately, it was inside the harbor. And then we had, on September 18th, a little more... Um, a little more distressing for in terms of a distress, I guess. Um, recreational fisherman um, off of Montana de Oro um, was spotted by a um, um, person on shore, um, shore fishing, and what he thought was a, a distressed kayaker or maybe a capsized kayaker offshore. Darkness was pending. This was probably maybe 6, 6.15 in the evening. Um, Harbor Patrol and Coast Guard responded pretty quickly. Um, this was somewhere a little bit north of Hazards, I believe and located two victims in a swamped 14-foot open vessel about 300 yards offshore. Um, Coast Guard got there first, pulled one off, and then we got there next with a jet ski, pulled the second off, got them both on the Coast Guard boat. Um, by the time we got them off their boat, their boat was too close to the surf line to really try and hook onto and get out, so it ended up going through the surf on the beach. Um, got towed up the next day up above the high tide line, so it's okay, but um, victims are okay. They reported had been in the water for about three hours. They were offshore further. Um, had been fishing, the wind had come up, it seemed like it was a wind, northwest wind and opposing southerly current, so the, the chop was standing up and they got swamped uh, a couple of times by some pretty big chop and their boat, well, it didn't sink, it kept them afloat. Um, they floated and signaled, they said a couple boats went by and a, not terribly far away, but obviously far enough so they couldn't be seen because they're so low in the water. Uh, they were pretty hypothermic, um, brought them back to the harbor office and warmed them up and um, got their stories, but fortunately we were able to get them back. The liveaboard's on a boat here in the bay, so that one fortunately turned out well. Um, could have been a lot worse, because it probably wasn't been much longer before uh, a fellow on the beach was going to quit fishing for the day, and those folks could have either kept drifting or gone in through the surf, and may have ended a lot worse, so that one turned out really well. And then um, on the 24th, a boat dead in the water inside the harbor, or just outside the rock, um, out of fuel, we responded, pretty standard tow in that regard. 
nothing really irregular there. City Council meeting activity on September 12th. Um, council approved a resolution to get us another, um, what's called a SAVE grant, S-A-V-E grant, from the Department of Boating and Waterways, which is our money we get from water, boating and waterways to destroy derelict and uh, surrendered vessels that people want to give up. So that grant amount was for $25,000, so that will keep us going a little bit more in that regard, which is good. Uh, also at the meeting on the 12th, we approved assignment assumption and conditionally authorizing the mayor to execute documents for the basically the sale of the Estero Landing or Estero Inn um, lease site down at the south end of the waterfront um, to new owners. So we've got some new folks coming in. Ken Scott um, been a great tenant there for probably better than a decade now. When he when he leveled that um, place maybe about five years ago now, when it was remember the old Sylvester's Landing and built the mixed retail um, hotel there now. So. He's moving on to other endeavors, and then we've got hopefully some great new folks coming in to run that. And then at September 25th council meeting, um, council approved a license agreement for the Central Coast Maritime Museum. Um, we had previous council approval um, to execute a license agreement with the city manager's signature, but things have changed enough since that earlier approval to current day's conditions, so um, we deemed it necessary to go for council reapproval, which we did. They voted for it unanimous, unanimously. And so now we have an actual agreement in place for the uh, Maritime Museum out in the Front Street and Triangle parking lot areas. Um, pretty big milestone for the museum. I think uh, we'll be trying to um, maybe do some sort of a groundbreaking later when the uh, museum gets ready to start building their actual museum on site there. So that'll be TBD, to be determined. Um, lifeguards, like I said, we've had a number of incidents on the beach. Um, been a busy beach summer if you've been down there. We've been you know four, five, six deep on cars. Um, lifeguards have done great um, under our lifeguard supervisors you know Kyle Schaefer went on to Port San Luis to work as a harbor patrolman there we got a fellow named Robert Tolan he's a retired state park lifeguard ranger that served 25 plus years down in Oceano Dunes so he was a great addition um, we've worked with him in the past on in interactions with different incidents up and down the coast so Robert was a great add but we'll be losing him at the end of the season so we'll be looking for a new lifeguard supervisor um, sometime this year and lifeguards are on duty weekends only again. Uh, they started that after Labor Day, and then um, they'll be doing that through this weekend, through Harbor Festival weekend, and then um, barring any really super warm, um, crazy surf days in the next couple of weekends, we'll be moving the towers from the beach pretty soon. Um, Dynagy um, is flushing their pipeline. Um, for those of you that may or may not know, and there's an attachment to the staff report here, um, the original PG&E power plant used to burn bunker oil, which came by tanker. The tankers used to moor just northwest of the rock, unload their oil into the tank farm that used to be on the Dynagy site, and they'd burn the oil. Well, that stopped back, I think, in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, and they went to natural gas, switched completely over to natural gas. Um, power plant changed hands probably four times now to Dynagy. Um, but every step of the way, the, the, the power plant owners, including Dynagy, kept the existing pipelines. There's a 16-inch and 18-inch pipeline that run from about behind the front gate uh, area through the dunes, um, underneath the dirt extension of Embarcadero, goes out to the creek, and then out through the ocean, maybe you know, a couple hundred yards south of the um, rock parking lot, and out into the ocean. And they've maintained those pipelines in case they ever felt the need to use them in the future for anything else. Um, they finally decided they're going to pull them out. Uh, there had been talk of using them for um, cables to bring in wave energy um, production, but that is, hasn't gone anywhere with Dynagy. So they're pulling the pipelines out. Their first project to do that was um, to pull it out was to what's called pigging, which is basically sending a little machine into the pipelines to scrub them as they go and then uh, push the, the dirty, oily water to shore and where they'll pull it all out on shore and treat it and get rid of it. Um, so they went out and started last week. Unfortunately, they had a little bit of an oopsie. Um, the, when they opened up the pipeline underwater, they had facilities there to contain oil and, and anything that's to come out. Um, but due to the rough conditions from the, with the ship operating offshore, something got a little bit out of whack. And the, you know, less, something less than five gallons of not crude oil, but pretty heavy oil came blurping out and they ended up going to the beach. Um, Associated Pacific was a contractor, uh, prime contractor for that. They pretty quickly got equipment on the beach. It was a windy northwest day, so everything went to the beach. Got all cleaned up pretty quickly. So um, they're kind of taking a little pause right now and, and revamping their equipment before they go start on it, hopefully again this weekend or early next week. 
Um, and that'll take them probably about a week to flush those pipelines. And as I said, they'll treat all the water on site, remove all the material, hazardous and other materials out of it, and then dispose of the water. Um, all being done with Coastal Commission and Regional Water Board and a host of different permits. Um, sometime this spring, they're intending to pull the pipes out. They'll likely only be pulling to the dunes just because it doesn't make sense to try and dig up the whole dunes to pull it out. They just want to get it out of the ocean and off the beach. Um, so they'll be working up to that project this spring. And then the remaining pipeline that they leave underground under the dunes leading to the plant, they'll fill with concrete and cap off and it'll just be underground there. So if you see the boat offshore and it's it's um, Frank Loving and his maritime logistics boats, the either Michael Ewell or the surveyor, I can't remember which one. Um, one of those two boats are the ones that's working offshore, so it's great that they're hiring local boats to do that. Uh, coming events, 36th Annual Harbor Festival. As we know, it's coming up this Saturday down on the Encore of the Embarcadero. Um, same setup as the last, I think this is the third year they've done this arrangement now. Worked out pretty well. It's one day only. It's free to the public. Um, great event. Lots of um, local purveyors and others down there doing their goods and music and all sorts of good stuff, so we should come down to that. Um, starting on the 7th, which I guess is tomorrow, um, through December 2 is the 4th Annual Surfboard Art Festival. So numerous artists have painted or put art on different surfboards and they're displayed all over town. Um, you can go view them, you can bid on them if you want to buy them, and then they'll do some um, judging of those come December and decide who's the winner and, and where the surfboards go. So that's an interesting event if you want to go see some pretty cool art. Um, concerts on the Bay, I think that's um, down at Giovanni's uh, parking lot, Giovanni's Fish Market parking lot. Um, we've had a number of concerts on the Bay. Had one, I think, last weekend, and there's a couple coming up here in the next few months. Um, you can go to website, www.fallfest.info for that. And San Luis Obispo Bicycle Club Lighthouse Century Ride is on the 14th of October. I believe that either comes from the lighthouse and comes here or it goes the other way. I'm not quite sure, but um, pretty big event, well attended. It's gotten a pretty big following, so um, you'll see that going on on the 14th. And then a few more events um, tomorrow, 3.30 to 4 o'clock, Morbay High School, San Luis Obispo um, Unified School District is opening the Morbay um, High School Pool, grand opening for the pool. Um, 3.30 to 4 is a ceremony. They'll have a site tour from 4 to 4.30, and then from 5 to 7, uh, the USA Water Polo Women's Senior National Team is here to practice. One of our coaches, Andrew, Andre Silva, um, not sure if he's coaching this year, but he coached last year as part of the USA Olympic team. Um, and so he's got a great connection there with the Olympic team, and so he's bringing the water polo girls here, or water polo women here, to do a practice, which will be kind of cool. Um, yet to be determined what the public use of that pool would be. As you know, there's the Community Pool Foundation that's thrown a fair amount of money and effort at, at uh, working with the high school and making sure we've got some good opportunities there for the public to use it. So we'll see how that plays out. But that's pretty exciting. It's been you know, 15 years since the city's had a pool, since the high school's had a pool. It's been a while. So it's good to bring that back to a coastal community. Um, Tuesday, October 24th. The Morro Bay Tourism Improvement District, the TBID, is considering including vacation rentals and RV parks into their assessment area. Currently, uh, all hotel room nights are assessed a 3% uh, TBID assessment, uh, but it doesn't include vacation rentals or RV parks, um, things like VRBO and Airbnb. So on the 24th, they're having a um, sort of a town hall meeting. Um, to discuss bringing the, the vacation rentals and RV parks into that. So 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. right here at the Vets Hall, Tuesday, October 24th, if you're interested in that. And we don't have any fishing stuff on here, but there's some changes to the recreational ground fish regulations. The recreational ground fishing has been loosened up a little bit more. As you know, we were down to about a five-month season and some pretty severe depth restrictions for a number of years. Well, they've slowly been ramping back. Fish and Wildlife have been slowly ramping back on that. And now they are changing their regulations starting October 16th. Um, there's a lot on this. I don't think I really need to go into announcing it all, but they've eased some of the depth restrictions. Um, they've eased some of the species restrictions. Um, probably best to go to Fish and Wildlife's website at www.wildlife.ca.gov and click on their recreational fishing regulations and you'll see what they are. Uh, but again, they've, they've changed some depth restrictions and I think some, some species restrictions and we're getting some, getting some ground back to be able to fish in, which is great. Uh, 
let's see. How about uh, we received a little pat on the Harbor Patrol's back. We received a letter from the Coast Guard um, thanking us for an effort we took on a reported overdue boat that was uh, reportedly fishing in Cayucas. And some concerned uh, either friends or relatives called the Coast Guard saying the boat hadn't shown up when it was supposed to. Um, so we knew the boat and the boat owner, and so we went out and started looking up towards Cayucas and then got some additional information that found out that it was possibly up in the Church Rock area, which is a place offshore, and so we went searching out there, and lo and behold, we found them. They were fortunately fine. They weren't distressed. They just changed their fishing plans and didn't tell anybody. So Coast Guard was happy with that, that we went out and assisted them and saved them the time and energy to go look for that and um, use our local knowledge to make something quickly come to conclusion rather than taking days to figure out. Got the pipeline removal. We've done, oh, no, actually, because um, you, you're probably going to ask, um, pipeline removal dredging. So um, Otna, the dredging contractor, is currently has their plans under review to remove all their pipeline that's stuck over on the sand spit. Uh, plans under review by the Corps of Engineers. We've provided all of our input from the city's perspective. Their plan basically consists of getting two small excavators kind of the size of the ones you probably see at Oasis, the little sort of what I call backyard excavator, um, launching those onto the sand spit inside the harbor um, in on the little beach in between the south jetty and the inner groin jetty, driving them down up and over the south jetty to the pipe, hooking onto the pipe, cutting into sections, and dragging it back across and pushing it off into the water and then towing it over to the target rock area where they're pulling it out. Um, we'll see how that goes. There's a lot of logistical challenges with that. There's some environmental challenges with that. Uh, they're having to get by off from fish and wildlife and regulators and um, state parks is not allowing them to go through state parks property for it so they're having to do it all from the city side. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, we do intend to start charging them for their space usage after November 1 because we're trying to help them along because they seem to be using us for a storage lot now. So um, we'll see what happens there. And finally, um, yours truly and the port manager for Port St. Louis Harbor District, Andrea Luker, um, went up to Sacramento on September 24th to the American Planners Association, APA, um, regional conference in Sacramento to give a pr presentation on working waterfronts. This was a request by Lisa Wise Consulting, who was one of the sponsors of the um, conference, and they also had a... Um, sort of a breakout session, an hour and a half long breakout session for working waterfronts. Um, Andrea and Port San Luis, they spoke about their Harbor Terrace project, which is their up on the back behind the harbor um, project where they're going to be building the RV camping um, storage lot type um, long term project that they've been working on for a couple of decades now. So she spoke about that, and I spoke about uh, Measure D and the challenges of administering it and interpreting it. So it was a good well-attended um, group meeting. There was probably a good, you know, I'll probably say 75 people in attendance from all over really the country because it's American Planners Association. Um, one good thing, and this kind of feeds into the eelgrass um, ad hoc committee, which I was going to save it for, but I'm going to bring it up now. Um, one of the folks that I just, after we were done and broke up and, and people were kind of wandering in the hallways afterwards and before we left, um, I happened to run into a fellow who um, is on the Humboldt Bay Harbor District board, and he's also a planner um, for the city of Arcata. And they had just finishing up with their own eelgrass mitigation plan, much like what Newport Beach did and much like what we're trying and tend to do. And so they're just wrapping up with theirs. And, and it, it, it was just happenstance that I ran into him, and I said, oh, my goodness, it, can we have it? And he said, yeah, I'll give you everything we got. I'll help you however we can. So got a good contact for somebody up there, and hopefully we'll be able to take advantage of that. Um, so that alone was really worth the price of admission of me going, Andrew and me going up there on a Sunday and taking a whole day to go up there. So that was good. And with that, uh, the pen hab, pending HAB recommendations, I guess I can go over that if there's anything new. I think there's a couple um, that spread over onto several of the boxes. Um, we did hold the first joint subcommittee meeting between our um, Harbor Advisory Board Working Waterfront Committee members and the Planning Commission subcommittee members. Um, held that on 9-8, uh, 8th of September. Um, really, we're kind of all over the map um, from a talking standpoint and didn't really get down 
and and make decisions or really determine where we're going, but came up with the plan for the next meeting. Unfortunately, the next meeting probably won't happen until late this month or early next month because one of the um, primary members from the Planning Commission, Mr. Ngarafia, if I pronounce that right, I think is taking about three weeks off summer vacation to go back over to Italy. So um, we'll be putting that back, back together towards the end of the month. I think that's the only update on that list. Yep. Anything else? Touching on the status of pending HAB recommendations, the second item, um, which is staff having incorporated the BMP effort and the <laughs> ongoing rules and regs and so on, what is the calendar schedule for that, please? As far as just the... the the, the, the ongoing the part. BMP yeah. particular part or the overall part? Uh, I think overall. Overall, I am intending to try and get that back to us as quickly as I can um, over the next two, three, four meetings, maybe five meetings. We got, as you know, we broke that up into sections and we handled one here a meeting or two ago. Um, just with all the other goals and everything else getting in the way, I just haven't gotten it back over to have, but I'm I've got kind of the bones of most of it, you know, all the research that I've done on the backside to, to implement sort of where the HAB recommendations came, so um, just need to get it together in staff reports and get it scheduled. Do you think we'll be able to wrap it up after the first of the year? I Yes. My intent would be, my intent is to get that wrapped up um, early part of the year and get it all implemented along with several other things, um, hopefully as part of the, for things that make sense that, that fit into the budget or into goals planning into that process come next spring. But yes, I'd like to get that done and out of the way and get that paperwork off my desk. Okay, thanks. And as it relates to the um, cost allocation internal gut check item, is there a calendar target for that insofar as the Harbor Department is concerned? Uh, not a hard calendar date. Um, as you know, we've starting a while ago, we were trying to get with our city finance director to go over back over the cost allocation and, and dig into it a little bit to, as a committee to try and get some things answered. Uh, budget got in the way of that, and then our city finance director leaving got into the way of that, and so and city manager uh, changes, and so, um, you know, really no nobody to take it to up in City Hall anymore, so we pretty much put that aside for the time being. Now we've got a new finance director hopefully coming on. Here very soon will be a good time to re-engage you know, once they get back on their feet. So um, I would hope to get that one done. We put a we had a, a date on, did we not? Looking up our goals here right now. Q two quarter two. So that's hence my question. Starting right now. Yeah. So the timing's good. Now that we're getting a new finance director, so we'll be looking to get that meet with them. I'm sure. With the new city manager, I know we, all us department heads were tasked with putting together a sort of a, a brief um, spreadsheet of all the projects and things we're in the middle of from, from administrative to capital to operational in which we all did. And um, I'm sure we're all going to be sitting down individually with that new city manager here in the very near future in November and briefing him and getting him up to date on everything. Um, probably doing the same thing, at least my intention would be to do the same thing with our finance director because I've got several things bubbling as well that are pretty high level that I need finance director input on that I haven't been able to do anything with because I haven't had a finance director um, other than our interim who left here a few weeks ago. So um, hopefully November I can get that re-going again and we'll be able to meet as a committee and with the new finance director and get that going again. And from the department's perspective, the item that has to do with the discussion that they have had regarding a portion of TOT sales tax and possessory interest revenue uh, being earmarked for infrastructure, for harbor infrastructure. Uh, and 
the status is listed as pending. Can you help me understand what that means today from the department's perspective? And that's in the in our uh, chart on the back. You want to point that one out to me because I want to see that where that is. Yeah, found it. So pending means it's pending means I haven't gotten a chance to take it anywhere. I think that's also a good discussion to bring to the new finance director. Um, I did have after the June meeting um, had some discussion with our then finance director about it um, and got some input on the topic in general, but nothing in depth. So I think that's going to be part of our um, gut check talk with the new finance director about the um, cost allocation. That's the time to bring that subject up. Okay. Uh, if I recall correctly, but I, I could be wrong, um, easily could be wrong, uh, the, uh, the board discussed this item uh, and discussed in light of the reality that the harbor infrastructure repair, maintenance, and improvements in the harbor infrastructure are, uh, in our opinion, not adequately funded now, and there's no prospects for the future for them to be so funded. Uh, and then that led us to thinking about a share of those items flowing, being earmarked uh, for infrastructure. Is there something, but we didn't take, we didn't make a formal recommendation to council, if I recall. Correct. Is there, would you advise that the board take additional, pay additional attention to this prior to you having a dialogue with an incoming finance director and or a new city manager? I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't think, no, because I, there's, Based on my conversation with the previous finance director about the issue, there's enough unknowns there that I think we as a board and as staff need to get more educated on it before we go jump into it and go start making recommendations because we wouldn't want to go, I guess for lack of a better term, tilting at windmills. Um, wouldn't want to go chasing after something that's just either implausible, impossible, or legally not possible. Okay. The last item uh, on the matrix right now is paid parking be established on and around the Embarcadero. And uh, as noted, on July 18th, 2017, uh, the board made a specific uh, recommendation to the Planning Commission, copied to City Council, Public Works Advisory Board, and Community Development Director. Uh, the last time we had a meeting, I reported that we've had no feedback, that this, this body has received no feedback from any of those entities, and that continues to be the case today. Correct. Uh, uh, Mr. Makowetsky, can you give us any advice? And I'm putting you on the spot, for which I apologize. Well, I don't know if it, um, I'd really say I'm being put on the spot because I think the larger issue in terms of the downtown plan, the um, waterfront plan, the issue in, because I can't be put on a spot because it's still up in the air. That's the easy answer. Um, because of those two larger issues of the downtown plan and the waterfront, um, um, waterfront master plans, as those items are still in process, the paid parking issue, likewise, is still in process. And that part I think we understand and appreciate, um, and I should have been a little uh, perhaps clearer. Uh, this this body, and this isn't uh, this isn't for you specifically, but w we provided input to three city entities to which from which we had no response, and that's not very comforting for this body. And that, and I was asking for advice about that phenomenon. Well, an, e an easy answer is I will reach out to those three entities and ask for a response. And then if we get stonewalled there, then we'll have to up it a notch somehow. The, the response could, could be exactly what no, you... No, no, and I'm totally it, with you. Exactly uh, what you just reminded yep. us. And if that's it, it, it so, exactly. and I, so as a very motivated, interested um, advisory body, I'm totally, I, I will do that. I mean, because I think that's rational. Okay, thank you. I, I have not been successful. Okay, no problem. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. 
Eric, in the last during the last meeting, uh, when you uh, you re reported to us or shared with us is a better way to put it, you shared with us that you had come across an entity called the California Maritime Infrastructure Bank, and uh, we've done a, a tiny bit of informational research. I think we understand what it is uh, in a very general sense. Can you foresee any, can you identify any projects or potential projects that are currently being discussed relative to the harbor in Morro Bay that might be candidates for that program? Boatyard is the number one project in my mind. Um, possibly replacing our harbor office could be another. Um, interestingly enough, um, in the CMAC meeting where I became aware of that, I, I met with um, a woman from down from the Port of San Diego in their in their leasing world, or in their operational world. Sorry, and, and um, we got to talking about comparing harbors and what's going on and we talked about I talked about our closed power plant and she said you know, that's in the maritime infrastructure bank was the core of the topic and um, Port of San Diego had purchased an Edison the Edison power plant down there in San Diego um, to run it for a couple of years and collect the revenues and then shut it down and turn it back into port property under into river revenue generating um, property and they did it with the California Maritime Infrastructure Bank um, funding, I believe the mechanism they used in the law, and most of the funding mechanisms that are used through there are through bond measures, through bonding. And so um, makes for some interesting corollaries if you think, wow, we've got a big power plant too that's just sitting there. Can we, can the city do some sort of bonding measure to buy that property and do something? Obviously, California maritime infrastructure leads you to believe it's maritime. Um, which the power plant doesn't have a lot of. It's industrial, but you know, there's, there's all sorts of potential wild and crazy ideas that if you had a, a funding mechanism to fund a big project that could be paid off over time, that could possibly be funded through that. So it's you know that one's above my pay grade at this point. But uh, boatyard becomes immediately to mind. Um, power plant, eh, maybe, um, but boatyard for sure. According to their literature, uh, and I'm virtually quoting uh, the, as they say, the CMIA, which is an acronym for the California Maritime Infrastructure Bank and Authority, uh, was founded as uh, not for was founded um, for the purpose of providing funding to the mar for the maritime industry, and as you say, the authority can access both large bond funding markets and small private placement capital markets, I'm quoting. Uh, municipal lease purchase financing is also available for certain types of equipment and infrastructure improvements. And they, as you've already noted, they list all sorts of maritime related things that they have participated in, in uh, providing funding. They also provide funding through, um, they facilitate a lease, a lease program. They provide lease financing for a variety of personal and real properties used by ports and their tenants, allowing the ports to match payments with the benefits received from the equipment. So um, the Harbor Advisory Board would like to encourage the city of Morro Bay to acquaint itself if it hasn't already done, you have, but I'm not sure, I don't know whether the city has or not, to acquaint itself with the California Maritime Infrastructure Bank and Authority and uh, uh, pursue uh, perhaps some of the opportunities that you, Mr. Director, have identified this evening. And as an add-on, now that you, know, you read their sort of their, their mission statement, um, it could be a funding mechanism for some of our capital needs over time. Instead of trying to come up with you know three million dollars lump sum to do a peer project or whatever, to get the funding over time because it's they did in one occasion, for instance, finance dredging, which brings to mind the state park state marina. Park marina. Yeah. If if the city was to yep. acquire that, yep. 
And my last question, uh, as it relates to your staff report, um, can you, uh, early in the summer season, when you folks put the, the new lifeguard tower down at the south end of the beach, you were, you were gonna see how well that worked out for you. How did it work out for you? It's been working great. I'm um, talking about the one up on the, on, by the parking lot. Yeah, we put it out last fall, really kind of towards the end of last year's season and left it up through the winter time. We actually used it a couple times in the winter when we had, you know, we, usually we get that December, January heat spell where it gets up to 80, 90, and we get big crowd of weekends. We used it for a couple of those weekends, and it's been a great platform. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely um, it really cuts down on the rescues because you get a better view down the line instead of out into the glare. So the tower, the guards on that tower are able to spot things ahead of time and alert the other towers to where you can get uh, what we call an assist or, an, or a, a public education and get to somebody and, and talk them away from where they may be getting into trouble before they get into trouble. So it's been good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else for the director, the staff report? Okay. So that takes us to uh, our business items. The first one is uh, C1. And uh, we do not uh, have any anyone in our audience this evening with the exception of Councilman Makowetsky. Uh, Councilman, would you like to address any of these business items? Otherwise, I'm just going to note for the public that I'm not going to call for public comment because we don't have any. Uh, I would like to note for the record uh, that at uh, 6.22 p.m. this evening, uh, a board member, uh, Neil Maloney, because of a a health issue uh, left us this evening. So, as you might recall, Neil injured his back very severely and uh, was in, experienced him some distress sitting here with us this evening. So, C1 update from the Marine Services Facility Boatyard Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, no report at this time. Okay. C2 update from the Finance and Budget Ad Hoc Committee. Um, Mr. Maloney is the chair. He left me some notes. His notes uh, are, uh, well, first of all, the uh, two members of the committee met with uh, the harbor director uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I believe it was. And what we discussed was um, the committee's what the, what the Harbor Department would like to see the committee do, if anything, between now and the end of the year. We were just doing some planning, some schedule planning. And uh, that led us to talking about things that actually we'd already discussed and just uh, thinking about where we would put them into the agenda. Uh, we reminded ourselves, and, uh, and I repeat the board's often stated position over the last two or three years, that the City of Morro Bay Harbor infrastructure uh, repair, maintenance, and improvement is at present, in our opinion, substantially underfunded uh, and to the best of our knowledge, insufficient future city revenue is earmarked for those needs. There's some very, very expensive infrastructure that needs to be maintained, uh, needs to be improved. It's the heart of the tourism engine for Morro Bay. and. Um, with the changes in city finances of the last five years or so, uh, doesn't seem to be very much money available for that. We also, um, the committee recognized that it needs to reprise and update the harbor infrastructure study that the harbor department and the committee developed a couple of years ago, just to see where we are. Uh, and then, um, we reminded ourselves that we had discussed, that the board had discussed in public, with the public, some recommendations regarding revenue to be potentially earmarked for harbor-related infrastructure need needs. Uh, the city taking over the State Park Marina, generating revenue out of the storage yard in the Triangle Lot, and installing a parking fee kiosk at the Embarcadero downtown parking lot as a parking program. And We've put those recommendations forward, and uh, we haven't heard anything about those things but from the city. 
and um, that's it for that committee. C3 update from the Eelgrass Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, the committee, as a follow up to the Anchor QEA proposal, the committee met to discuss the scope of work. As it was uh, noted in that proposal, we had some uh, problem. We disliked some of those things that were class that could be classified more as historical uh, or background material, such as the dynamics of eelgrass. Um, and we recommend, and then I, with the The board uh, gave authority and approved that we talk further with Eric about the scope of work. I met with Eric, and we then decided that uh, to try and focus more on what we should do going forward in order to develop a mitigation policy that uh, we should concentrate on the path forward as well as perhaps what kind of mitigation could be done that has not been done in the past in Morro Bay uh, and the lessons learned from their work with the Newport uh, policy. So since that conversation with Eric, we have not done anything more. The only other addition is I met with um, Miss Praya. Don't tell me I forgot her name. She's a professor at Cal Poly, working with uh, uh, management of resources, and is very interested in also volunteering. She does has done a lot of work in policy development of resource management and uh, after one conversation with her we will I will introduce her to the committee uh, I think she might be very helpful with her background in policy development questions Bill um, so with that Lynn so we have not entered into an agreement with anchor at all we're still discussing it not to my knowledge so Lynn, I don't that, know if they have responded to Eric. So Lynn and I, we, I've been working with Anchor and right. trying to iron out and reconcile what the input I got from the board versus where we think we want to go with this. So I'm um, working with Anchor and getting that resolved to get them moving on giving us some help. Lynn, given the critical path for the process of establishing an eelgrass poly mitigation policy for the city of Morro Bay, what is the next benchmark activity in that critical path? Uh, I think at this point we're waiting for recommendations from Anchor um, to, with their with their experience in developing policy, uh, to give us some guidance on that. Through NEP, we have a lot of scientific information about what eel, how eelgrass grows and what it's doing here in the Bay. Uh, but in policy development, uh, this is where we are lacking and I think in need of help, policy development. And would, the, would that be done on a consultancy basis or an advisory basis or what basis? I don't know, perhaps with Mrs. Ms. Verna's help, uh, the committee, the ad hoc committee would be able to go further. I think uh, writing policy is beyond us right now. So that would be, uh, Anchor has experience in writing policy. Okay, and then my question wasn't about the, the, the end game, but was the next, whatever, the next step. The next step. Um, is talking with Anchor and seeing what they recommend. 
Gene? Yeah, um, Eric, uh, did you mention it was a Humboldt policy on the eelgrass? Yeah, Humboldt. Um, my, my question is whether they Humboldt used Bay Harbor District. Whether they used a consultant or not. And oh. maybe whether we want to reach out to that consultant. If they yeah, I didn't one. go. Well, I, he, the, the, the fellow I met, he was a um, commissioner on their, on their Harbor Commission itself for Humboldt Bay, but he works for a consulting company that I believe actively worked on that project. Plan West Partners Incorporated. So, um, he's so this kind of is, on both sides of the table. In that. Yeah, this is kind of new development to us. Yeah, but it, it wouldn't hurt to to reach out and say, hey, you oh, know, yeah. what, what can you give us? Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully we'll get. He pledged that it's, it should be coming soon. Their actual plan and everything, all their work product they they've put together. I would assume there's going to be a bibliography or some sort of credits or whatever. The, all the people that worked on it in there. So, and I, we can inquire to him as well. But. Because Humber Bay is similar to Morro Bay, so yeah, that's yeah. good. It's north coast. Okay. Anything else from the board on the Eagle Committee report? Okay. Next item is an update from the Marine Sanctuary Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, there is no activity at present. Next item is the update from the Working Waterfront Ad Hoc Committee. Gene. Uh, yes, we met. We met um, September 9th, Excuse me, September eighth. With two members from the Harbor Advisory Board, two members from the Planning Commission, uh, we had Scott from the Planning Department and Eric, and then we had a number of public people um, show up. Um, we received their public comment. Um, we interacted with them. We didn't just hold them to a specific um, time. They were able to interject and present their comments throughout our meeting. Um, we brought up several points that we need to establish as far as definitions. We were left off with um, tasks that we were supposed to be looking at for our, towards our next meeting. Um, unfortunately, I have not been able to find any minutes of that meeting. I thought Scott was going to do that, but I may not have been able to find that. Um, I looked this morning and I still couldn't find it. Um, but we will have another meeting towards the end of this month and across you know, the first part of November. And we were working towards um, establishing some kind of definitions and, and uh, setting some some boundaries, I think, for Measure D. Uh, I, I would probably, because eventually we're going to be getting into the legality of, of the statements that we come up with, it may not hurt to have the city attorney at one of our meetings here to help guide us through this, this process. So that's where we left off. When you you just use the word boundaries as it relates to Measure D, what what did you mean by that, please? Well, it's establishing um, definitions for the various uses of Measure D. Um, I'm not really sure whether we can change the definitions of, that were established on Measure D. Whether we can need to go back to the municipal code or general plan and change some of those definitions. We're looking at statements that say things like um, commercial sport fishing. Well, what does that really mean? So we may need to change that, that definition or establish what that definition is. So. Okay. That's just one of our items that we need to look at. Okay. Questions? Comments? No? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Brings us to C6 Harbor Advisory Board Work Program for City Council Goals and Objectives. Goal 1, Objective D, Work Program Elements 2 and 4 regarding licensing slash permitting for certain harbor tidelands business harbor slash tidelands business activities c6 and there are two elements to c6 this evening um, work plan element two work plan element four we're going to address work plan element two first because we don't perceive that we have any conflicts from the dais uh, work plan element four uh, relates to folks who provide uh, professional services and other services for uh, for profit on the bay, and both Mr. Dowdy and myself fall into that category. So we're going to recuse, our, recuse ourselves from that item, and uh, the vice chair, Ms. Meisen, will take over at that point. So let's address 
uh, through Eric. Let's staff report, please. Thank you. So I think how we'll handle this, as you said, we'll divide up into two elements. We'll go through element number two, take public comment, do whatever um, deliberation, commentary, recommendation we do on it, conclude it, then go to element four, um, where yourself and Gene will have to step out. And if you want to give public comment from the floor, you can, and then um, leave the room, and we'll finish up on that one. So sort of a, a two-part on this one. So. Working on a couple council goal objectives. Um, these are both goal one, objective D, which I believe was revenue generation, economic and fiscal sustainability. Um, a number, or item D was evaluate opportunities for newer expanded revenue sources, including but not limited to paid parking, marijuana associated revenues, other tax measures, and review of city fees. That was the city's overall um, goal objective, not necessarily our Harbor, Harbor Advisory Board. So um, our elements played into those. So. Um, element two is to research and to bring to council for consideration moving for-profit events and activities from a public area use permit process where there is no revenue generation to a license agreement process with the re revenue generation. Um, as an example, um, well, let me go into, uh, I guess, discussion a little bit more before I go into that um, element of it. Um, I combine these two items together. I think um, the chairman and I had initially discussed in, in putting this agenda together was um, a different, I think maybe it was food trucks or RVs um, putting on the agenda for consideration. Then I realized, you know, we need the overall um, overarching sort of uh, policy and procedure to implement that before we need the actual item that we're going to implement. So I backed up a little bit and came up with these two work plan elements as, as being necessary to put in place before we did that. Um, as you know, we're a Tidelands Trust Enterprise Fund, and anybody doing business within the trust, there's a um, potential capture of some of that revenue by the city to, for the city to put that back into the trust. That's our, our goal in life, and that is our um, reason for existing to a large part in addition to public safety. But, you know, we manage all of our 30 leases on the waterfront and 90-odd businesses, a portion of which go back into the city. And, and um, that's to, to make sure the city is, you know, living up to its fiduciary responsibility to the state and, you know, conducting the Tithings Trust in a safe and orderly and professional manner. And um, marine-related services are one of the items that fit in there. Um, so examples of some for-profit events um, that occur on Tithings Trust properties, which Tithings Trust basically goes from um, in at Morro Bay, offshore the in at Morro Bay, um, north all the way through the waterfront and on to the beach to about Highway 41, where Highway 41 um, takes a turn in front of the wastewater treatment plant, So, and then out three miles. So we have a portion of the beach that is within the Tidelands Trust. Um, one of the most standout sort of activities that occurs on our business activity that occurs, and not just an event like Kite Festival or um, Harbor Festival, where it's really more of a nonprofit just putting on a public event, but there's people on our property that are conducting business and business for profit. And one of those is um, wedding planners and corporate retreats and, and things that occur on our beach. Currently, the city's process to implement that is a public area use permit process, a PAUP process, where the various departments weigh in, fire has their you know fire considerations, or their open fires, and they're cooking food. Police you know, has their con concerns and considerations, alcohol and whatnot, public works, everybody. Um, Harbor, one of our concerns has always been you're out there making money on the Tidelands Trust and, and basically doing it without um, benefit of a license or any kind of a permit process. So um, we've identified that as a potential revenue source for one, but also you know, protection of the city's liability to make sure these folks have proper insurance and, um, and, it, and the level of the playing field as well. If you think of moving on to food vendors, which we're not really talking about tonight, but um, Food vendors out um, have sort of an unfair advantage, the, the mobile food vendors with the brick and mortar folks. So making sure we have a level playing field. Um, so we're, we're probably going to end up kind of going over these things twice because they're, um, they're related. Um, the other type of business um, that's occurring in Thailand's Trust are, are folks that are giving what I call maritime services or, or um, coastal dependent services. Um, boat cleaners, boat repair folks, canvas folks. Um, the example here on the dais is, is Gene with his mooring um, services, mooring repair services. And so there's folks like that that while they may have business licenses, 
Um, they're not otherwise um, otherwise licensed or permitted through the Tidelands Trust to be doing business on Tidelands Trust property. So um, we'll talk about those second. So we'll end up kind of going through these um, items maybe twice. Um, so I basically broke this down into um, about eight different sort of questions that I'll, I'll take input on and, 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 and not necessarily limited to all these questions, um, but I'm, I'd kind of like to get your input um, in general, and, and it can be either by a recommendation or just by general consensus, and these things I'll, I'll take forward as, as part of my research as I bring it forward to the City Council at a future date um, for their ultimate consideration. So um, unless the Chair has a better idea, we can just go through um, these items one by one, take your input, and get all the discussion done, and then we can move on um, to considering the the business sort of entities versus the the event sort of entities. No, that's fine. Uh, okay. Again, items, your discussion items one through eight, more or less, depending on the item, relate to um, work element number two or work element number four. Uh, I do have a, a general comment, uh, sorry, question for you. As it relates to these proceeds, where would they go? Harbor Fund. And for those who don't know, what does the Harbor Fund fund? The Harbor Fund is enterprise fund consisting of basically our, our west of the center line of Barker Arrow businesses, which are on public property, and the revenues we generate that we take in lease fees and boater user fees and other fees from folks doing business in the Tidelands Trust um, go back into management of those properties um, for overall management, but also for public safety and for improvement and providing public facilities and managing open space and recreation opportunities and um, basically the same things the city does for the city. We're sort of a miniature city doing that for the waterfront and bay. Thank you, that was perfect. <laughs> You're welcome. And, and uh, I'll put it in the form of a question. Does the Tidelands, does the city's agreement with the state of California as it relates to the Tidelands Trust involve a mandate relative to the, the use of those lands? And what happens with revenue that is produced off of those lands? Yes, it is a mandate. State Lands Commission is our landlord. They ultimately own the submerged tidelands and waterfront properties. They own it because our modern waterfront used to be in the water and got built up in World War II, so after the war it was still deemed public property, so that's the why, why the way it is. Um, so yes, there is a mandate that we manage those properties in a revenue generating sense. Um, to to all the uses to to promote and manage the uses in the Coastal Act, which in 1947 when it was enacted was commerce, navigation, and fisheries. So we were to promote and encourage and manage commerce, meaning businesses doing things on the waterfront, navigation, meaning you know boats and harbors and providing facilities for boaters, and fishing, meaning commercial and recreational fishing and the things they need. So those are the first three things. And then as decades went on, we had recreation, environmental protection, and open space, and all sorts of other things. So yes, we have a mandate to, to manage those properties in that manner. And also per the Tidelands Trust, all revenues generated stay within, and it's a defined, surveyed, if you will, area that you know, has a, a shape drawn around it, and all the revenues generated there are supposed to go back into management and upgrades and facilities and all the things in the Tidelands Trust. We do pay a cost allocation to City Hall for the services we get for City Hall, um, which aren't isn't necessarily directly back into the Tidelands Trust, but it's for all the services we need from City Hall to manage our responsibilities as a as a trustee of those properties and an owner of those properties. And is it correct that that litany of activities that that you described <coughs> require funding? 
Say that again. I missed the first part. Sure. In, in the middle of that very good explanation, you identified a number of activities that through, uh, through the Coastal Act are, are required, are necessary. And is it the case that those activities in one way, shape, or form or another require money? Yes. Oh, yeah. Hence the background for why we're doing this, why we have this agenda item. Correct. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so again, well, these, well, hang on half a sec. Oh. So any questions from the board for as it relates to the staff report to date? Bill? Um, just, just one um, question, or actually two questions. For instance, <clears throat> an event that's going to be held like a surf contest. Where do they have to get a permit from? Do they get it from the Harbor Department, or do they go to the Parks and Rec? And do they have to pay a fee for that right now? They go through, right, they go through Recreation and Parks, through the Public Area Use Permit. That's where the personnel are that manage this. Uh, those permits are, depending on the permit, some just circulate by email through all, they basically circulate through all the departments, and we all provide our feedback. Things like Harbor Festival and Kite Festival and probably the, the car show that, that involve lots of different departments and are, are pretty um, involved activities, we'll sit down with the applicants for the, uh, or the, the promoters of the actual event and go through them face to face and with maps and everything and, and do a little more robust process. But yes, it goes through recreation and parks with input from all the other departments and there's the basic permitting fees for, for acquiring those permits there. They're really just an administrative fee that's in theory recoups the administrative cost for issuing the permit there's no revenue real revenue generation component to it so are we then being tasked tonight to make a recommendation for these certain one-on events that you we would be charging a fee and a percentage or all of it would go to the harbor department's fund is that correct that is part of what's under consideration yes i for and i i things like harbor festival Kite Festival, which are really some run by nonprofits, some just by Kite Festival. You know, it's Sean Farmer at the, the kite shop, or he's he's just running that as a citizen, as a business owner. Um, it's more of a public event for public promotion, and there's really no revenue generation potential there per se. Versus things like the the company that's doing weddings on our beach, and they. You know, you, you're the Jones family, and you want to do a wedding, and they charge you, you know, four thousand dollars to put on a wedding. Well, people are that's just just pure profit making. So that's more the things we're interested in. Surf contests are kind of somewhere in between. They're usually not a big revenue generator, although there are sales going on there. So that's something to be considered. All right. Second question: uh, as a as a business owner and as a person, i.e., Gene, that has a business license with the city, um, I'm under the impression that gross sales that Gene does, whether it be mooring um, work or any type of work, goes to the city and he pays a percentage based on his gross sales. So the Harbor Department really should have no business um, with any of that money. Is that correct too? I mean, I mean, that's how it works right now. Currently, anybody that's got a business license. Correct within the city pays the business license fee. And, and I, I'm not an expert on business license, but you, you probably are better than I. Gross percent to the city. Yes, you it's do. Not, a, not, not in Morro Bay? No, no, it's not a percent of your sales per se. It, it's based on the size of your business and number of employees, okay. I believe, is how the fee's structured. But that goes all to the general fund. But it's if you're an employee, if Ron's an employer of, of two people and you know does a certain amount of business out of a certain size place, he, his fee structures this. Where if you've got 20 people and you're 80,000 square feet, you pay a higher fee based on I, I apologize. your business. The city of San Luis Obispo charges 0.025 percent of gross sales. There, there, there's there's well, no there's no B and O tax to my knowledge right. in the city of Morro Bay. Okay, that's all I ask. That's all my question. Okay. Any more questions? OK. 
Okay, so like I said, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna go down through these eight sort of questions. I've, most of them are, are um, formulated with both these public area use permit type things and the water dependent serving, you know, boater serving type businesses as one item. So we'll be going over them twice. And again, these aren't do all be all. There's certainly other things that could come up as we go along. So um, I crafted these with um, a question and how it should be pursued. And, and this will be drafted into policy, which eventually get into more municipal code. And then I put my staff recommendation based on, you know, my um, knowledge and whatnot and what I would think we should do. Um, so we'll, we'll just go through these items one by one and, and then circle back to the other types after um, Gene and, and Ron can recuse themselves. So, um, but bear, Bearing in mind that this relates, this agenda item relates to for profit activities. Correct. Which are, like I said, Well, again, I, I, I divided these up into um, for-profit events and activities that currently get, generally get public area use permits that occur on our properties. Um, for hire planners, like I said, um, wedding and other planners could potentially be beach item vendors, which we don't currently have. We had a fellow who was pretty close to getting up and running, but he didn't. Um, food trucks, surf lessons, things like that. Um, the other group, for-profit businesses conducting business on Tithens properties, um, what I sort of call the marine dependent or, or boat harbor serving would be boat cleaning, bottom cleaning, surveying, six-pack charters, things like that. So two different categories. So yeah, we're on category one, which is the the not the boat related business and harbor related business type stuff. So uh, first question is how should um, periodic or what I call one-off events be um, such as surf contests and kite festivals um, be permitted? And again, the, the kite festival isn't a, a money maker. Surf contest is somewhere in between. The example I always use is a company called Beach Butlers, which does these events here and down in Port San Luis and other places. Um, how should those um, be Handle. Should they be remained under the public air use permit process or um, go on to a um, license or permit agreement process? And we're going to handle this as we have come to practice to do. I'm um, going to go one end down to the other, and the next item turn around and come back the other way. Gene, item number one. Yeah, it has to do, um, the way I look at this first question here is, um, is there a public benefit to this? Is it encouraging... Um, use of Morro Bay. Yeah, surf contest, definitely, I see that as, as, as providing a service to the city and the, the local people um, and encouraging Morro Bay. And they're picking up, tourists are picking up, um, the city's picking up some money through tourism money. Um, so I, I would agree with you. So the city public area use permit process, we work just fine for that one. And again, thanks, Gene, for that. Cause my, and I didn't get to my recommendation. I would recommend... Um, that yeah, those stay in the public area use permit process, and that's a, a great way of terming it, sort of the public benefit events. Peter? Um, yeah, it seems like surf contests are often nonprofit, and a lot of events are often for nonprofit causes, right? Um, I was, how about Avila and <clears throat> Port San Luis? How do they handle weddings? If I remember right, they do pretty. Weddings? If, if you as a, a just a citizen you want to do your wedding on the beach and you're planning yourself you just we would do a public air use permit I'm sure it's something similar in Port San Luis the company that I refer to Beach Butlers they go do a license agreement down at Port San Luis and and we'll get to that a little further um, how they do their process is a little different or it, maybe not a little different but how they do their process is one thing um, but that's how they handle theirs is is through a um, for, for a company like Beach Butlers, they do a license agreement. Yeah, As we consider these items, again, we need to bear in mind that this applies, this is conceptual now, because there's going to be lots of, I'm sure, exceptional questions. This relates to activities that are for profit. Their purpose is to make money. Lynn? Um, well, following 
that, then these one-off, or at least the surf contest and festivals, the two examples mentioned here, are not for profit. And let me throw, I guess I should put a clarifier or a caveat on there. I put that one on there because to sort of I, not put those ones aside, but my recommendation is those stay on the city's public air use permit process, um, that we not consider those as a, a money maker or a potential revenue generator or something that needs an additional layer of government permitting and so um, hence your recommendation yeah hence my recommendation so I will clarify a little bit those are generally the the sort of public non profit -y, not profit making businesses that that first question is about but if a, if a promoter came down and wanted to put on a different kind of festival and was either charging an entrance fee or promoting a product for sale and cloaking it as a festival of some kind, music and selling instruments, just to pull something out of the air, then that would be for profit and be under your other rubric of licensing. It wouldn't be just a public Yeah, at use. some point something like that could cross over into the yeah. other realm, yeah. And that would be sort of case by case basis. Even, even though it. exactly, even though it might have a quote public benefit unquote, yeah. I I inter, it I could have inter some kind of a public benefit, but the main reason is to make money for the promoter. So, and that could be written into the policy and the implementation of it, just like when planning commission deals with permits, the planning director can make findings of significant public benefit or findings of this or findings of that to justify the direction they yes. want to go with it. We could do the same thing in yes. this if we made findings of others. Significant public benefit, even though you're selling a couple of guitars on the side, this is significant public benefit, therefore it fits in the category A, not category B. That could be part of it. Dana? Dana? Uh, as far as this is concerned, um, I just have a question for the city public uh, area use permits. Um, All right. Yeah, my question about the city public area use permits, does any of that trickle back to the harbor or to the Thailand's Trust? Negative. Was that a no? <laughs> that was a negative. That kind of negative. Didn't come out right. Okay. Well, I kind of want to go with staff's recommendation, but I would like to see a portion of that fee go back to the Titans Trust or the Harbor Department. And let me, Lori just whispered in my ear here, let me put a, a qualifier on that. When, when events come through for permitting and they take extra city services and they're not city promoted events that the city is, and there's a list of four or five or six that the city says are the city sponsored events, when the, those other type events come along and they take an inordinate amount of fire service standby or police for barricades or whatever in harbor as well, we do bill for our direct time that we have to spend extra on those events. So that part does come back to us, but the general administrative fee for those permits, no. Okay, so you're saying if they're doing something like, say, they're filming a movie or a commercial or something out here and they have to barricade the roads or whatever you're yeah, doing. Yeah, exactly. They get charged for that. Yeah, if it takes an extra five police officers, six hours each to do something, then they'll get charged for that. And the same thing with Harbor. We've charged Harbor Patrol and boat time to some of those type of events. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. So, in other words, I, I uh, agree with staff's recommendation then. For item number one. For item number one, yes. Bill? I concur. Okay, brings us to item number two. Bill? Excuse me. Oh, sorry. I'd like to wonder if I can follow up on that. Sure, sure. Dana, would you consider a yacht club regatta um, a public benefit? And do you pay for, do you pay for that? Yeah, I do, but that's a leaseholder, and that's not a uh, one off event. It's, okay. It's something that's continual, and yeah, it is part of a. We're, First of all, we're a not-for-profit. Um, whatever proceeds we make, they just go into maintaining. And um, it's all like our summer sailing program. 
that's a public benefit. That's something we do for the public recreation. Yeah, I just wanted to establish that. So item one, concurrence that we're status quo, those things, public area use permit, and, and in deference to Lynn's comment about some things that might cross over and we get right into, certainly into the policy or process that there's... A consideration for public benefit. Yeah, consideration for public benefit. Okay. Uh, and following up on Dana's uh, comment that oops, that uh, you charge for the costs that are involved to different departments, such as police, fire, or harbor department, you're charging for your cost, but you're not putting anything into your general revenue on that. It's only at, on co at cost basis, right? It's a personnel and equipment time cost basis. So if I have two harbor patrolmen that, that spend three hours on a boat for such an event for standing by, like the Morbay Triathlon, there's one for you. Yeah, um, uh, but I think, Dana, weren't you looking for something a little more than that, that if the city is getting all of the benefit of any revenue of the permitting process, then some of that should probably go to the harbor department. Harbor fund. Yeah, I don't know the the amount of the fees or but the permits. The fees are only to cover costs. Yeah, the permit fees aren't much. The, if if any of these events ever generate anything over a couple hundred bucks from a fee standpoint, it's almost always the the cost to provide personnel and equipment. The fee itself to to put on an event, you know, like for the Morbay Triathlon, I'll use that one to apply for and get that permit. Outside of the personnel costs, you know, because we put extra harbor time in, some lifeguard time in, and police and fire put a little time in that they get charged for, the fee permit's just administrative fee permit. There's really not much. To, I'm going to say it's less than $200. Right. And I, I see that as a public benefit. I, th I think that's the discretion, you know, where the city's looking at, well, this is public benefit. These are, these are the residents here uh, enjoying the outdoors uh, are, and uh, having an event like that. But say you have somebody filming a movie where they're making millions on a movie and all we're doing is paying for our staff to block the roads they're while, paying they, for while public they invade use our permit. town, yeah. I think we should have a much higher fee. Yeah. Bill, number two, start us off on number two, please. Um, I do think that any type of business activity should be done on a uh, RFP uh, once a year basis. Yes, definitely. Dana? Yeah, I agree that it should be on a as needed and, and one at a time looked at through an RFP. I think that's a good way to go. Maybe I'm confusing things, but um, your examples of for-profit business, and this would be the for-profit business, uh, vessel maintenance and repair, bottom cleaning. So do those activities come under this? So my recommendation there mixes both those uses up, both those categories up. So we're on category A, which is the for-profit events and activities, not the the marine dependent businesses okay. so okay. Okay. my recommendation on the on the for-profit events and activities is open RFP process I had originally thought oh my god we have to do this once a year but Port St. Louis does it that way and it gives maximum opportunity for other people to jump in and the brick and mortar folks that are already here that may want to participate so my recommendation on those sorts of business was an annual RFP very good I agree Peter yeah, I also agree. That makes a lot of sense to me, that an annual permit would be the way to go. Gene? So this request for proposal, is that put in by the applicant to you guys, how much he would pay you, or is this a standard fee you want to look at or something? It would be on a negotiated basis. Um, Port San Louis just puts them out annually, just as a matter of course, whether they've got three operators doing three different things, they just put it out annually and, and then negotiate per whatever the people propose back in. 
Okay, so you guys put out the request for, for yeah. proposal. Yeah, I mean, okay. I would suspect we would have some sort of, hey, here's our minimum rent or here's our minimum fee or whatever. We'd, we'd have some parameters in it, but it'd be. Okay, as long as it's reasonable. It seems to me there might be some number of activities that wouldn't f lend themselves to an, to an annual approach. You have you are the one who has the experience. Uh, I have I don't know who the applicants might be. The kinds of applicants uh, we've just got the board majority of the board just said yes to the annual concept. So are we precluding then an as an as needed basis? Did we just preclude that in our No, I don't think so. I would I would view it as let's say we did an annual RFP process and the RFP process closed and you know we we took on you know business A, B, and C and those were the ones that we had operating. If somebody came along four, five, six months later and proposed something, I don't think the door would be shut on, shut on them and say no, sorry, wait till next year. I think we consider it and then when it came time for the annual renewal, then that one would get RFP'd again. That would be added to the list, is how I would see it. Okay. Could you, could you give us an example of, of, of um, an activity that three businesses would apply for, please? For my clarification, I'm having a hard time. When you say an RFP, you're going to do an RFP for what? I mean, give me uh, an example. Weddings and other okay. corporate retreat type stuff? So in other words, you're, you're going to do an RFP and you're going to include that these would be the three Contract. contractors that would be able to work in this in the, in this yeah. area. Okay. Food I, trucks, okay. vendors of beach stuff. Like okay. I said, we had somebody who's really close. And there's an item coming along a little bit later that um, talks about limits and how many numbers are you going to apply allow. Let's say we, we put this out and we get... 20, and this is an extreme example, you get 20 folks that want to do beach vending. Well, we're going to give them all 20 a permit to do it? Probably not. So there's, so that question comes up a little bit later. But the essence, the essence of this particular concept is, this is a question, not a statement, is that the business is interested in operating within, in the Tidelands over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. It's not, I want to go do this on June 22nd. Yeah. Correct. I want, I'm interested in offering this service or the, what doing this business for a year. Right. So, so if we'll use the wedding planner and uh, the whole business of that. So if somebody decides that they have somebody that they want to put on their wedding, they could come to the city, even though there are three companies that are doing them annually, but say you had one that just, you know, somebody just had to have these people do it, then they would have to come to the city and, and make some kind of deal. Or could that happen? Well, that's an interesting question. If, let's say the wedding planner example again, and we let's say we've got, you know, we RFP'd it and, and one company applied and we got into a license agreement with them and they've yeah. got it for a year. Somebody else comes along three months later, hey, I'm, you know, Mary Jane's wedding planning company. I want to do this too. Um, do we? I guess your question is: Do we consider them, or do we say, "Hey, wait for next time around"? I guess they could work with the other company. I would say you, you got to wait for the next time around and yeah. bid for it. If okay. if something totally different came along that we didn't have that type of service for, I would say, "Hey, let's consider it now as a one-off," and then come RFP time, then you throw it up to RFP and they can reapply or. And open up somebody else. So there would be the opportunity to consider it on a one-off basis. If, I, if 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 my daughter wants to do Mary Jane's on June twenty-second, and Fred's bridal service has the RFP, has a con, has a licensing agreement with the city. Mary Jane gets no, Mary Jane doesn't want a subcontract. <laughs> no, she doesn't want to do that. Mary Jane wants to do her own shtick, um, and. And and she would be considered and she would be considered on a on a one off. On no, a, I no, I, and maybe I need to clarify my answer. In that case, I would it would be my position that if if we already had a license agreement for that kind of service in place, 
and company B came along that no, you got to wait until we re RFP it. Put the wedding off. Wow. Or or or, with, or the Jones have to happened? go to the other company. What happened here? to the free market? <laughs> I mean, I'm all for, trust me, you know I'm all for the Harbor Fund getting as much money as it can for the reason, for the purposes that we have long and often stated here. Um, but I think we need to have a mechanism that it does not restrict free trade. That's just my personal opinion. It doesn't mean that's what the board needs to do. Okay, well, I mean, so noted, I, it's, this is all just sort of policy development and things that will move forward. Um, we can certainly... It's a good conversation. ...look to others to see what they do, and, you know, eventually this goes well, to the Well, you know, council. I think a wedding planner is probably not a good example, only in the sense, because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, everyone's going to have their own personal wedding planner, and if we're going to... How many weddings do you have on the beach anyway? <laughs> like right now? I mean, about, Lori. Do you... One. No, it's not one. There's probably there's probably between three to five of those events. Not weddings necessarily, but this one company does maybe three or five of those permits a year. Five is probably the extreme end. Doesn't happen often. A few. Okay. Gene. Where we need to move on to number three. Clock this, this is just a general question. How much revenue are we talking about? Are we talking about ten thousand dollars a year? Or are we talking about a thousand dollars a year? Is it worthwhile to be doing all this? No. Just. I have no idea what sort of revenue generation this would entail. Too early, too early to know that yet. We're in the conceptual stage, are we not? Yes. So number three, Gene. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it to me. <laughs> I'm still reading this thing. That's okay. Um, That's okay. Um, and each of these, bear in mind, and for the public to understand. Each of these has a staff recommendation. Each one of these items, these eight items, has, has a staff recommendation. Let but we're not it. looking at the marine-related one, right? And on, this, and on this particular item, the staff recommendation, first part of it is for the marine-dependent folks, which we're not dealing with right now. It's for, so you got to look at the second part. Okay, we're looking for the number and types of businesses or activities that are licensed or permitted. Um, I agree with Ron. Let the market... Decide. Peter. Oh, Owen. I've only called him Peter three times tonight. How come you didn't correct me? How come you didn't correct me? I know your name is Owen. How come you didn't correct me? Well, if I say something bad, like, you're way too polite. <laughs> oh, rather you talk to me. You're going to talk to me outside. No, no. I'd, 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 I'd rather you think it was Peter and not me. So. Um, uh, I apologize. That's okay. Um, I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, to me, looking at number three, um, yeah, I would think that letting the market decide, it, you know, if, if there was suddenly huge problems and, you know, fist fights breaking out between wedding planners or something, we could, <laughs> you know, then you could <laughs> maybe consider something more limiting, but I think the market could decide initially, at least you would think. But. Jay? Well, that might be a future for a reality show here. Uh, Lynn? Um. No, I don't think there should be limits, but I'm, uh, if you're still talking about license, licensed slash permitted, meaning those things are almost the same, uh, from our conversation, it seems like we should have two things. One, a permit, if somebody wants to conduct that activity over a period of time, i.e. for a year, be it every day or five days a week or three days a week or whatever, and then... Um, for a license and perhaps a permit if you wanted to come in and work one or two or three days for a very limited time that it should be something different. And I, I put license permit together on all these items with a slash in between because in, in my mind, and maybe I should have made this more clear, 
Um, there's a legal distinction between the two. And I'm using them interchangeably at this point. As I move more forward with this policy development, I'll be getting input from the city attorney. And if it, if it, if to the city attorney it looks and smells and feels like a, a license, then it'll be a license. If it looks and smells and feels like a permit, it'll be a permit. No, I, I think we can anticipate that anything that has a duration on any significant duration is going to be a licensing agreement. I think we can assume that for the purposes of this discussion and on a case-by-case -case basis would be a, potentially be a permit. And licensing also conveys maybe a exclusivity, so to speak. You know, if you, hey, if you got one wedding planner, you've got a license to do that versus a permit is more of a case-by-case-ish thing. But that's TBD, to be determined. So number three is about market determination of the number and type. Correct. Without regard to the type specific. So anything, Lynn, anything else on three? No. Okay. Dana, three. Uh, yeah, I don't think we should regulate it too heavily. Um, but just to go back to your license permit thing, I think of licenses, you know, could be business license. So if you have a business license and then you're talking permits for whether it's a use permit or whatever, uh, yeah, that's there's there's a lot of different <laughs> options there. Um, but anyways, I would, as far as the, the question goes, I would say let the market take care of itself. Bill, number three. Let the market take care of itself. Okay. Bill, number four. Quick question before this. Um, the paddle board um, rentals that are over there on Coleman Beach, are they permitted right now? Usually there's two or three. How does that work? Two of them are, yes. Well, the, the two main ones are the paddle board company, which Correct. is operating right. down on the waterfront through a sublease, and uh, Morby Paddle Board Company in Marina Square? then they both have a mobile trailer born version that they move back and forth with. So yeah, both of those go through subleases. So, uh, and they are subleases at Coleman Beach? They are subleases at, one's at Marina Square, has a brick and mortar shop at Marina right, Square, and right. one has the other one down by the, the Harbor Inn Suites. Um, but they also have the mobile component that they are permitted to go operate down off Coleman Beach and other public areas. They did that through their business licensing. So really, number four is basically, should we limit maybe those paddleboard companies to people that have already a sub, -late, sub a, a sub lease within the waterfront? Is that correct? Well, the question is, do you want to restrict? Do you want to do you want to sort of force anything, any activity into a sub lease situation exclusively or not? Um, kayaks and SUPs is just one of the examples I used. Um, do you want those only to be operating out of a sublease to, so that they, they're, or, or conversely, if there's already an existing brick and mortar location like stand up paddle, and somebody else wants to do a completely mobile stand up paddle kayak rental, it, but you've already got the brick and mortar folks, well, how do you, how do you deal with that? You can, deal with it on a fee basis to try and level the financial playing field between the brick and mortar and the other, or you can just not allow the, the freelancer. You know, I'm a little, I'm a little, um, that's right. I think the RFP process kind of levels yeah, the playing yeah, I'm field. I'm a little bit mixed on this. I mean, I think that if an activity, um, we, we maybe should give the brick and mortars the first opportunity or the first right of refusal. I mean, I think we should support the existing businesses on the waterfront first. That, that is my, my opinion there. Oh, okay, so let's think about that as step one. Would there be a step two, which is that if they declined, if the brick and mortar operator declined to participate and, uh, and a mobile operator wanted to come, was willing to come in and do it, should there be a, a some sort of licensing fee 
attached to the to the mobile operation to try to level the um, the competitive business environment. Yes. Or the, not. The, yes, or, I think so. Or not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Dana, number four. Yeah. Uh, is this marine related? But anyways, I uh, I agree with the staff recommendation. I think that just the fact that they do have a brick and mortar, they should not they should be free to, to participate whereas otherwise you're looking at a fee for someone who just shows up with their trailer full of kayaks or paddle boards whatever and and as i wrote in the in the recommendation the way santa barbara handles um, they've got what's called business activity permits and port san Luis is a licensing agreement so two they're both doing the same thing with different names on them for whatever reason santa barbara they track the gross sales of their charter boat operations. So there's a number of charter folks that are just operating out of their slips. Plus you've got the landing doing their charters. And they annually look at their gross sales to make sure they're not having a detrimental effect on the brick and mortar folks. Exactly what their rubric is to determine that, I'm not entirely sure. I'm still trying to figure that out of them. It's, as a can of worms. I think it, it it's probably has much to do with when the volume starts rising from the brick and mortar folks, they, there's a problem and they need to start looking at it. But uh, it, right now, it looks like from the, the data I've seen that, that Lori dug up, the the the, the non brick and mortar charter operators generate about five to six percent of the total revenue of all the charter boat operators operating in the harbor, including the brick and mortar ones. So they, they capture a pretty small share. And I don't know if they've got a, a number that if they hit, they decide there's a problem. Repeat that, please, because that's your Well, I just said. No, repeat it, please. Yeah, at least that's what they're reporting. <laughs> well, that's what which, audits are for. <laughs> which, which brings me, I'm going to interrupt the flow for just a moment. Forgive me, but I'm going to ask a background question here. So. Um, quote, where gross sales are, re are reported and tracked to ensure detrimental effects are not occurring on the brick and mortar locations, end quote. What's the mechanism? What's the mechanism to report and track Well, that's what sales? I just spoke to a bit. I, they, much like we get our annual gross sales from our leaseholders, it's a, a form that goes out and we occasionally do audits on them to make sure that they're keeping honest with it. I don't know specifically what Santa Barbara's is because I haven't gotten that far with their business folks yet. Number four. Uh, and my comment here relates exactly to that. I have heard comments from some brick and mortar businesses when, uh, and they're re the, what they are required to do by the city and according to their license, and then the uh, competitor comes in who does not have an actual lease. Uh, and their requirements are almost nothing. And so the business that has the lease and is an established business feels like he is really operating under uh, very severe conditions compared to the subleasee who does not have to abide by a lot of the rules and regulations. Uh, and I could see here where if you had the brick and mortar business already established, somebody else comes in who's only mobile and doesn't have to abide by any rules and regulations, it would be very difficult to establish a fee structure to equalize those two businesses. Um, so what is my opinion on that? <laughs> you just gave it. I did, yeah. Uh, that it makes it really a conundrum. You cannot well, equalize that. I, but the On thing the is, other hand, you want a you want a free market. Yes, Bill. But I think uh, what we said too is that we give the brick and mortar the first opportunity to do yeah. an activity, and that they happen to decline for whatever reason. And there's another way to address, to address your concern, Lynn, and that is to make the licensee, the requirements on the licensee would be to replicate the brick and mortar revenue reporting. It's embedded in their lease. Mm. 
make that part of the requirement. You can't get a license unless you agree to that reporting. And it will be done on an annual basis as opposed to a five-year basis. And you show insurance. Like that. So establishing um, many of the same requirements that the brick and mortar guy has to abide by. Well, so, so, some of them, yeah. Some of them. Yeah, revenue reporting, yeah. insurance requirements. And on that case, I would agree. Peter? I did it again. I'm looking at you this time. <laughs> I was waiting for you to correct me. <laughs> I, you're too fast. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> no. um, I, I was wondering, <laughs> to me, it's very, the kayaks and stand up paddle boards are really sim similar to the charter boat operations um, in some in some ways um, and I was wondering is there are they limited to Coleman Beach or can they launch them off the dock at Tidelands or no they're not limited to Coleman um, I know the paddleboard company sometimes does stuff off of Tidelands okay because to me to me that would open up the same liability issues that we haven't talked about yet but potentially um, that seems like a dangerous activity at least as dangerous as sport fishing um, so that would be one concern you know that they have liability insurance although this isn't really what we're talking about I guess I mean all um, of them would have insurance yeah <laughs> but um, at any rate yeah I think it's I, I see Lynn's concern but yeah also I would maybe consider the wear aspect too because some like some people might want to kayak near Coleman or wherever Coleman Beach and some people might want to be more towards Marina Square so and to not have 10 people with mobile operations at somewhere like Coleman Beach might might be a consideration um so, so is, is that a, are you saying a, a geographic density factor? I think so, yeah, although this, that's not really what... As, as a consideration? Yeah, of. yeah, like, if, like if, if the two shops already in town have already are at Coleman Beach, having five mobile guys show up there might be a problem for those guys if, and they're, since they already have existing businesses down there. Okay, Gene, number four. Uh, the request for proposal process, as you mentioned in your staff recommendation, would probably um, balance the equation, and so um, I'll go with that. Okay, number five, Gene. Six-pack charters, how should six-pack charters be handled? Um, staff recommends the existing policy of allowing six-pack or other charters and or passengers for hire operations out of existing lease sites only due largely to the additional liability involved from loading and unloading passengers on public facilities. Um, I almost feel like that goes in the other category, the, our second review. Um, but if they're working underneath a brick and mortar uh, business, um, then I assume that that's part of their gross sales that included under the, the sublease. Yeah, it's once if you're operating it you know, Fowler's or Giovanni's, yeah, that's part of their, well, not Giovanni's, because they don't have that lease, but, yeah, they would fall under the gross sales and all that stuff. Yeah, I think that already takes care of it. Hey, hang on, we'll get there. Owen, number five. Yeah, I think I would agree with the staff recommendation that they're at existing places, because they could end up, it's not that hard to license your boat as a six-pack and get a license for that. So I would, it could really, they could run rampant, I think, pretty easily. <laughs> yeah, Santa Barbara does it, in my estimation, the way they do it, because they're, they're limited on landing space um, for folks that want to do that. So they let folks operate out of their slips directly and where we've got a little more landing availability, I think. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, <clears throat> it would, yeah, the slip thing would be really problematic from my perspective. Like, if when I need to load up and go fishing, there was a herd of 
charter fisherman. Well, we wouldn't do it out of <laughs> our fishing boat slips. <laughs> anyway. These yeah. are guys, and there's currently folks that are doing it off the islands or out on the launch ramp. Yeah. Yeah, to me that... Freelancing is what yeah. I would call it. Mm. Yeah, to me, I would agree with the mm. staff recommendation. <laughs> Lynn, number five. Um, in the past, have they always been uh, only allowed to load at existing lease sites? Currently, that's how our rules and regulations read. Chablis used to load at Tidelands. Yeah, under special events once in a while, we they'd be allowed to do that. Okay. But they're supposed to operate off of their landing. Uh, I would agree existing. Dana, number five? Uh, yeah, I don't know that there are existing lease sites. So the ones I'm thinking of, they're just renting a slip, and they could be just about anywhere on the Embarcadero. So... They're just paying their slip fee and then running their business. And whoever their landlord is, uh, they're the ones probably dealing with the liability of passengers coming up and down. So I'm not sure about the existing policy. I would concur with the staff recommendation. I, have a I think I have a question there. Um, I, I'm thinking of two different six-pack charters that I know of that are a recreational sailboat. And so going back to this, I, they're not a brick and mortar. They don't have a lease with the city necessarily that I know of unless they do. Do they? Where they depends where they're operating up. We do. We have had some sailboat six-pack charters operating off of existing lease sites. There's one operating out of a stair landing, or stair in, the Red Anchor guy. So that's an existing six-pack charter operating through a brick and mortar. Okay. With the brick and mortar, I consider you know a stair landing. There's no shop or office there per se that they go into and check into and go, hey, I want to go rent a boat. It's Okay, that's, that's but they're what they're still was, operating through that lease site. As long as you guys have that, it's not just like they're just paying their rent for a slip and running a business. They're, you guys are, no, that's reported as percent okay. gross sales. Sure, and taking it's, care of it's that. not just renting a slip and then. And the same thing at Harbor Hut at the, yes. the Cameron. Okay. Is it possible for somebody with a recreational six pack to operate off of a mooring using a tender? Is it possible for that to happen, or is that happening? In the city of Morro Bay, is it possible? Or yeah. is, are there policy, is there a policy in place? Currently that? now, you could not, unless you went over to Morro Bay Landing or somewhere where that use was allowed and did it through there. Got it. If you went over to, to Tidelands or Launch Ramp and picked up your passengers, no, that's not permitted currently. Okay. All right. Brings us to number six. Um, Bill, number six. Actually, is that is that number? Yeah, that's the uh, that's, that's the that's other number four. Yep, yeah, that's so, the. So let's see. Uh, six applies only to the seven. Seven applies. Water dependent folks. So bill number seven. So on this one, you take ten percent of gross sales requirement. Correct. This is, this is the staff recommendation. A 10% of gross sales requirement for uh, for for-profit enterprises such as wedding event planners, rentals, sales of equipment, goods, and food drink vendors. And those would go into the harbor fund. Is that correct? Correct. I agree. You agree with the concept, or you agree specifically? I, with I the agree with the concept. With, with the 10%. I, I think 10% is probably good. I mean, I don't I don't know that much about it. If if the the staff feels that 10% is adequate and reasonable then I'll go along with it and that we could can or probably should write the policy that it's not set in stone and negotiable and we can always negotiate it up 
state parks is generally 20 percent on everything i would i would suggest i'm sorry dana you're you're next sorry go ahead yeah i would i would agree with staff's recommendation of a 10 percent uh or whatever they think is is doable there for non-marine related businesses Lynn. percent of gross sales in it is in addition to a flat fee the flat fee then would cover a minimal cost of uh, issuing that fee to the city and the percentage then gives a bit of profit to the harbor department is that a way to think about it? I hadn't really thought that out it could as our subleases, as our, our leases go, there's a minimum rent, and then for gross sales that exceed that minimum rent, you pay the difference. It could be crafted that way, or it could just be crafted a flat percent. Mm -hmm. Well, fees should definitely be charged <laughs> on whatever basis, uh, and this sounds reasonable, whatever basis makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> this is the second time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's see. Um, so let's see. I, I, I think that that's... It's a little bit teachable. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah, I think 10% seems reasonable. Wait, you know. In addition to a flat fee that, yeah, like, as Lynn was saying, I guess it would then, but just to cover administrative costs, maybe. Gene? Um, I don't have any problem at all with a with a flat fee for the recommendation to start with, um, but a ten percent of the gross sales, um, you know, the, the profit on the whole gross sales may only be ten percent. So, so the ten percent of gross sales, I have a problem with. Um, I think that needs to be determined on a case by case basis. And I would suggest consideration, and I have no idea idea what it might be because I don't have any data I would uh, consideration to some kind of a scaling I mean, which is kind of along what Gene's saying yeah 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 case by case depending yeah. on what the business is or if I if I'm a licensee and uh, my and my gross sales are to pick a number five thousand dollars a year <clears throat> and I have operating costs and all that sort of thing but it's okay I'm willing to do it my net's probably not going to be very much if I have uh, the same uh, licensing agreement and I have fifty thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars, that's a different program. Okay, brings us to number eight, Gene. How should license permits be approved administratively by the city council? I would say the city council. Um, I think I I feel that it should probably it should be the the harbor department really because I mean the city council has a lot going on and it could be it could be a lot on their plate I mean I don't know how many permits or or licenses we'd be talking about but it says Marie yeah no actually I guess. We should be. Yeah. yeah, we should be. Non marine. Non marine. Yeah. yeah. Lynn? Um, it seems to me that kicking this kind of thing up to the city council is uh, wouldn't be particularly appropriate since it's the harbor department that uh, much more is going to be familiar with the costs. Uh, the actual what do I want to say the, how much it's going to affect the environment and the area of the harbor so I think it should be the harbor department that approves okay Dana yeah I think if it's in the Thailand's trust then the harbor department should probably I think the moral bay Harbor Advisory Board should actually create all these fees. No, uh, the Harbor Department 
should take care of those. Bill? I agree the harbor department should be um, taking care of these. This is not appropriate for the city council. We get bogged down, we'd never get an answer. And my position is that it would, they would be administered through the harbor department and approved by the harbor director. Okay, any other no nope, of discussion on that? So you two have the opportunity to make public comment. All right. Then we'll do the same routine one through eight. So do you have some initial words to say on this, Mr. Director? Or shall we just start? No, we're, we're going to go through the same routine and, and look at the recommendations right. and, and go through the same items. So. Uh, okay, it seems like we now have public comment. Would Good you evening. Step forward. Can limit yourself to three minutes, please. Gene uh, Doughty, Lancy Interface, uh, 201 Main Street. Um, I have a mooring um, company that works on the bay. Um, I would probably like to see more people from the public be aware of this item. Um, there's the guys who clean bottoms of the boats, the guys who do rigging on the boats. Um, there's, a, there's a whole group of young individuals, men and women, who work on the waterfront, and they don't make a whole lot of money, um, including me. Um, I would just hate to see this become a, a great big money-making venture. I don't think there's a whole lot of money to be made here. And I think the process of doing this uh, may be cumbersome and difficult to enforce. Thank you, Mr. Dowdy. Ron Reisner, Morro Bay resident. I'm a marine surveyor by profession. Uh, I have concerns about my having the opportunity to obtain a license, an exclusive license, to conduct marine surveying on the harbor. I think that's a restriction of trade. And, uh, and I'm concerned about the logistics of me going to the city, i.e. the harbor department, on a case-by-case -case basis to get a permit to conduct a marine survey never done that in my life in any port I've ever worked in all over the world and it seems a little onerous to me although I do support the concept of various and sundry activities that take place within the Titleist Trust uh, paying a fee for the privilege of doing that and that fee going to the Harvard into the Harbor Fund to maintain those those uh, lands thanks thank you mr. Matthew. Yes, Mr. Reisner, if you would return to the podium, please. We have a question for you. Yeah, so you're unable to get a business license or just a, uh, what you said, restrictive as far as uh, being the only one to do the surveys? Is that what you were uh, talking about? Not at all. I have a business license in the city of Morro Bay. I, I've been I've been participating in, but let's suppose for a moment that I've been listening to the discussion and I've read the and I've read the uh, the agenda item, and as I understand it, that um, it's there is a possibility for marine related business to have the opportunity to go to the city of Morro Bay and obtain a license to conduct a particular activity, and and uh, that might or might not give me an exclusive for those activities and even if it does give an exclusive and I'm not the holder of the license then as we, as has been discussed this evening I might or might not have an opportunity to get a permit on a case by pay for a permit on a case-by-case -case basis that was the essence of my comments thank you Okay, so if we start with uh, question number one, 
uh, now related to marine services. Uh, and the examples are there at the top. Vessel maintenance and repair, bottom cleaning, marine surveying, six-pack charters, or others that might fall into that rubric. Uh, Mr. Buffet, periodic one-off or periodic public events. That doesn't really apply. No, this one doesn't apply. It, number it one does doesn't apply. apply. No, that's exclusive to the last one, so straight to number two. Okay, number two. <laughs> Business activity licenses are permitted to be issued on an as-needed continual basis or periodically, annually, be a request for proposal review process. Uh, I um, kind of um, agree with both Ron and um, Jean to a certain extent. Maybe we are getting a little bit uh, heavy-handed. Um, and is there really a problem? That, that's just my opinion. So I, I'm, I'm not so for regulating this. Dana. Yeah, I, I think I could just say something that would cover all of these items as far as marine-related businesses in a working waterfront. I think that if we just... You know, we were talking about uh, what Gene was talking about, individuals here and there. You know, if they have a business license with the city, then they should be able to do business year-round. I don't think there should be any added permits. And if it's marine-related, I don't think there should be a percentage of gross sales necessarily either. And I think it should just be the business license, at plain and simple, just like it is outside of the waterfront, with the exception of the funds coming back to the Harbor Department. Um, yeah, the only other one would be the one-offs or this and that. We're not even dealing with those with the Marine-related, so mm -hmm. I think that stands for pretty much all of these. Owen. Sure. Um, yeah, I, could, I, I kind of agree. I think that it could be an unnecessary burden on businesses unless, you know, I don't think we've heard at least hearing from Gene and Ron that there is, you know, an over, uh, too many people horning in on the marine survey businesses or that sort of thing. So I think we should kind of listen to the business owners of that particular business that are already operating. Okay. Um, I agree with you too, but I'm thinking more in terms of the guys that I'll hire on occasion to work on my boat, uh, an electrician, and he comes in and he does a project, um, does a few hours worth of work. Does he need this business license? I mean, does he need this additional license? If I hire somebody to come in and help me paint and sand, and or the diver who goes down uh, once every six months and cleans the bottom, They're, the amount of gross sales that they would do is uh, unknown, probably a, not a whole lot. Uh, they work generally independently. It's not like they're establishing a, a business with employees and uh, something very elaborate. It's really simple and very small and I would see this as being somewhat onerous on those guys. And you would discourage them from coming in and working, which I think is even worse because it's less maintenance on the watercraft around. Uh, what, what are you talking about that, that's onerous? Is there a, an additional fee that you're talking about outside of a uh, business permit? If there, is an, if there are additional fees, <clears throat> if they have to answer an RFP, that I see as being onerous to some I would of these agree. Guys. I, would, I, I think it should be just like it is Until on, it gets on the other side of the street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, and, and, if you're, and if you're here just to do a one-time deal or something, then I believe they have one-time business permits. You don't have to pay a, mm -hmm. one for the year. Um, but 
it's the same thing on land. If someone's coming and working on your house, that electrician, whether he's working on your house or your boat, he has a permit for his business, his business, a business permit with the city, then he's good to go. Whether he's working on your house or your boat, it shouldn't matter. It's the same business. Okay. Agreed. So do we consider that as having answered all of these points? You can. I don't necessarily say I agree, but you can. <laughs> In that case, we will. Yeah, we can. Lori will go grab Gene and. Oh, thanks, Matt. Hopefully, it went far. I think Gene's probably within earshot. So we're concluded on that. Any other questions, comments? Okay. that section, I will turn the chair back to Mr. Wright. Do some presentation thing. I don't think he's coming back. Is he coming back? He's not coming back. He had to absent. Okay. So now we're uh, agenda item number C7. Harbor Advisory Board work program for City Council goals and objectives other, quote, other added item number one, end quote, regarding waterfront lease site contractual conformance. Mr. Director. So thank you. Welcome back. So the other item, as you saw, as you know, we had the number, goals, and objectives, and then we had a couple of other items that the council added on as part of the work plan objectives. And item number one was review on an annual basis in segments all waterfront lease sites for conformity to contractual agreements for building use, maintenance, signage, access, safety with 100% of all lease sites to be reviewed in a three year period. Um, our current lease management policy states we have our lease sites inspected every five years. Um, historically, we've conducted these um, basic fire safety inspections. Um, every five years using our fire department personnel. Last one done was 2012, so being 2017, we are due. Um, out, of the, out of the inspections, lessees are generally required to do any to correct any deficiencies, and then we do follow up um, compliance jointly with um, fire and harbor departments, depending on what the severity and nature of the issues are. Um, stemming from our experience on the seawall situation at the boatyard lease site, um, probably about two years ago now, um, last July we required all of our lessees with the requirement in their leases, not all of our leases require our lessees to do this, but those that do, and it's the majority of them, we require them to conduct a, a survey of their seawalls and bulkheads and revetments and other water lease improvements. So basically everything from the top of the rock revetment seaward um, for any maintenance and repair issues. Um, and then follow-up surveys and discrepancies identified is ongoing with those. I will say that our language in our leases is not the strongest in requiring those inspections be done and what the actual requirements are and who does it. Um, but we did get pretty good compliance with those inspections and we are currently um, working on following up on ensuring that those leaseholders are doing what they need to be done based out of what um, was found in those inspections. Um, moving forward here, uh, making a recommendation or at least a sort of outlining a process. Um, as you know, a property inspection can be costly and follow up um, on discrepancies, time consuming. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm struggling with following up on all those um, water lease revetment inspections. It's a body of work um, to do and track and maintain and write letters and then if people aren't complying, where do we go with it? Um, so it really a simple, achievable, cost effective and lease friendly approach is warranted what we've historically done in the past, and this is the system I inherited, was generally the fire department doing basic um, fire safety type inspections, and they'll cover other things as well when, when there's some glaring deficiencies, but they're not an inspection like you would think of, you know, buying a house or maybe 
purchasing a commercial property where you hire um, a home inspector to come in and go through and, and look at your electrical and plumbing and everything else and see where the deficiencies are to bring that into the purchase. Um, we don't go to that extreme. Um, so what I'm seeking is your, your input and recommendation on developing an ongoing rotating inspection program, much like what we would like to develop for our audit program over a five-year cycle, not really a three-year cycle, although that's what the, the goal work program element is. It makes more sense that our current policy is over a five-year cycle, so why don't we spread these out over five years and do one-fifth over five years um, and just constantly rotate, and that way we keep current with them all on an ongoing basis. So um, the basic outline that I'm proposing, and this is what I kind of get your input on, is um, create separate spreadsheets and tracking for um, what the conditional use permit. So the, the inspection criteria we're looking at, and I guess maybe I should follow up on that a little bit first, or the items that we're tasked with, with reviewing. Um, building use, well, that's what's allowed for in the conditional use permit. Do we have a lease site that has a use that is not allowed in the conditional use permit for that site? Um, is an example, um, Otter Rock Cafe has um, full service restaurant, uh, retail, and then um, slip um, vessel um, slip services. So if they were to go off and do something that wasn't within their conditional use permit, um, that could be an issue. So reviewing the conditional use permit. Maintenance, that's the thing I just talked about with mainly the fire department um, doing safety inspections. Um, what are the maintenance issues? Is, are, is the structure being properly maintained? Um, things up to code? Um, things of that nature. Signage. Um, as you know, we have a, a sign ordinance. It's about ready to be updated um, and, and get a new sign ordinance in place, but um, every business is supposed to, every sign they have is supposed to be compliant with the sign ordinance. And um, as you know, there tends to be sign creep in some of our lease sites and, and lots of signage goes up that really don't get any sort of review. So looking at signage annually, um, looking what the signage permits are and what they are permitted for versus what they have. Access, um, meaning, are, are there any ADA issue, access issues that potentially could be looked at? The harbor walk, the, the 10, 8 to 10 foot path on the backside for public access, is that being maintained or are tables and chairs starting to move into them as we've had on some of our sites um, and things like that? Safety inspections, electrical, on, electrical code compliance, slip electrical is really the big safety issue. Um, and then the other fire safety stuff we do. Um, so those are sort of the issues at play that we'd be looking at. So um, putting together a, a, probably a spreadsheet or binder on, on every lease site, <clears throat> seeing what the approvals are, seeing what the sign permits are, um, maintenance repair inspections and the status of everything and, and creating a, a relatively robust but simple enough tracking process to where it's, it's simple and um, achievable would sort of be um, step number one to sort of get a baseline of where everybody is. Um, and look into the cost of hiring a professional commercial inspector um, with some sort of experience in the marine environment to come in annually and budget for it, um, and hire an outside gun, so to speak, to come in and do these inspections for us and, and put it out to RFP and have a scope of work and, and outline on what we need and, and put it out to bid and see if we've got a, a commercial inspector that can come in and do it. There's plenty of home inspectors out there, and I imagine there's folks that are the same way on the commercial side. Um, Again, issue a request for proposals for then so those inspection services over a five-year cycle, budget for it um, annually during the budget process, and continue to engage with the fire department to insist with their normal business safety inspections. In theory, the fire department in any municipality is supposed to periodically go and inspect businesses for compliance to fire safety issues, um, whether those are um, storage of materials, um, hazardous storage of materials or other um, combustibles, fire sprinklers have been inspected or are in operation, proper operation, those sorts of things. So continue to work with the fire department and keep them involved um, and then develop an effective and consistent follow-up and compliance enforcement protocol. And again, keeping in mind, um, you know, department's tasking and what, you know, what we may be able to achieve versus what would be nice to achieve. And then implement it in the upcoming fiscal year because there's going to be some cost to this. I can tell you Lori and I and, and, and Charlie are not going to be able to put together a big robust inspection process and implement it and enforce it and keep up on it. We're going to need some help. And so hiring some outside um, consultancy or um, um, 
contractor to do it may be the way to go and budget for it in the next year. Okay. Jean, start with you. Um, earlier this week, I had a young man from Royal Bay High School who wants to become a marine engineer, and so he was kind of shadowing me for a day. And I was explaining to him that working on the waterfront is considered the hardest place to, to build and maintain in the world. Either things are rock hard, super soft, um, not only do you have the normal loads that you're subject to on a building, but you have ships running into them, you have tidal waves, things are going up and down, back and forth, things are rusting, rotting all the time. So um, at least a one inspection every five years is not enough. Um, I proceed, I did some of these inspections on the bulkheads and seawalls earlier this year, and I can see where things have rotted and rusted quicker than within every five years. So I like the idea of an ongoing process all the time. Um, I don't know how you'd establish who goes the first one five years or not, um, but I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I would agree that <clears throat> it seems like a great idea and to get some professionals in there to look at things. And then as far as like on a as needed basis if the harbor harbor patrol guys were to see something that looks suspicious it, it's probably already happening that that, that might have that this might allow to get someone in there to quicker if, if you guys which i imagine you guys have that in mind but yeah our harbor patrol does occasionally i mean usually what we discover is is you know sort of gross issues like for example a uh, grease trap, you know, underneath that's fallen apart or overflowing or hasn't been cleaned and, or somebody will report something like that and a lot of times we'll send our harbor patrol in to go confirm things like that. So there is a, a degree of involvement with them already. Yeah. Would there be some way of having like some very basic training by some marine engineer or somebody that, you know, that you, if your guys see something while they're, you know, driving their boat down, the boat down the harbor, See something, say right. something. Yeah, see something, say something. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Something we can look into. What? Uh, I would agree with Jean. Yes, it's a it's a very very harsh environment, and this is something that really should be done. Perhaps you would avoid uh, disasters how to do it and keep it going without it becoming so expensive that the, the businesses along the waterfront could afford to pay for it is something else. I guess it would depend on the intensity, but it certainly is a good idea. Do you know? Yeah. Obviously, this is something that needs to happen. Um, I like the idea of putting together individual spreadsheets or binders or whatever for each lease site, and that you know, start researching for uh, what kind of uh, inspector you would need, uh, what the qualifications would be, so that you could put that out for an RFP. Um, yeah working with the fire department obviously because they're already supposed to be doing inspections so that would be helpful um, whether you had s somebody going along with them looking at other parts of it or whatever make that might make that a little easier I'm not sure but uh, I was just had one question so say you have problems at your lease site would because these things need to happen would there be any help as far as getting from the city as far as getting some of the permits because that's sometimes the hardest part of doing any project is getting a permit I mean working with Coastal Commission these are it would obviously be existing structures or infrastructure or whatever yeah most I would anticipate most issues identified are going to be maintenance and repair deficiencies that don't require going back to coastal because you're not adding or improving or 
group building something bigger. So um, in that regard, I don't think coastal would be a factor so much. Pilings, yeah. Uh, we start sea to do walls. some significant sea walls. significant in water work. Yeah, that may transcend over into the other realm. But <clears throat> in general, um, yeah, I, building permits would be required for a, probably a fair amount of structural type things. And so, um, I mean, we always have been. I think the city is as helpful as we can in helping folks through that process. We generally, as a hardware department, haven't had a big hand in that um, unless a permit crosses our desk for comment but otherwise we don't have a big role in the permit process well I'm in favor of this staff's recommendation well as the majority of the board has already identified uh, the board in its various constituency and experience thinks that this is essential we've expressed this opinion before historically um, I like I like what the staff has done with its one two three four five six its suggested outline. Uh, certainly, number one is absolutely essential. It has to be electronic on a database format. And what the uh, and, and you've identified most, but perhaps not all, um, of the checkpoints. Number two, insofar as uh, a quote a professional commercial inspector end quote um, seeing as how I do this for a living I have perhaps a little different perspective I think that there would be one or more qualified individuals involved uh, we uh, in uh, as a marine surveyor I participated in condition evaluations of uh, both the waterfront improvements and the uplands uh, improvements in a variety of facilities and it tends to they tend to lend themselves best to, uh, to to more than one set of professional eyes and expertise uh, I am not for instance a fireman so while I'm familiar with NFPA National Fire Protection Association uh, uh, regulations or codes as it, re as it relates to these facilities I'm not the expert in them so I would suggest uh, perhaps that the department take a look at their fortunately there aren't all that many take a look at each one of the lease sites and determine what sorts of things that you in your experience and perhaps in, in the experience perhaps as in the experience of maybe some advisory professionals should be looking at for that particular site on a five-year cycle and five years is the longest you can possibly go I totally agree with Gene it goes away in a big fat hurry and anybody who's been in a boat and gone <clears throat> alongside closely alongside our waterfront um, and knows what they're looking at uh, sees some pretty I was going to use the word alarming but I go with scary pretty scary things right now today as we speak so and then um, I uh, as far as putting on an RFP for one or more qualified professionals to engage them or the services uh, you you identified that as of doing that for a five-year cycle I might suggest that that's a, that the agreement be on an annual basis uh, just divided up into pieces it could be the same person but uh, same entity I sh should say but um, and then um, help me understand does for instance as it relates to uh, to fire safety does the city of Morro Bay fire department are they obligated under city policy to examine these various improvements down there and if so what are they looking for and what is their what is their inspection cycle I don't know the answer to that it's a good question I know they do regular business inspections, but and I don't know what the rubric is, whether they do it by area or business district or how that works and what the legal obligations to do that, are, if any, are. Okay. I know we've just brought them in on our five-year cycles to have them do our stuff about every five years from sure. a fire safety standpoint. Sure, sure. Yeah, any repair and maintenance done on the waterfront, then the fire department does come in and they're one of the inspectors on the job. Any. 
if, if it's a permitted project, then the fire department reviews the plans to start with, and then they go in and make sure that that was complied with. as part of the permit process. Right. Okay. So there's a, I guess that's something that we need to find out about is <clears throat> the scope of the permit process as it relates to this particular topic. And then number five, you said develop an effective and consistent follow-up and, compli and compliance enforcement protocol. Without belaboring it this evening, in the and we have what three different generations of leases currently? I mean, in general, in a general sense, lease language. Three, four. Okay, but yeah, generationally, and, and, they all have. Pretty sure, without exception, language that says you got to maintain your lease site in a safe and orderly, clean fashion. Okay, and where I was going with that is a question as to whether that whether that language includes regulatory requirements. And I use the word regulatory advisory you know, on an advisory basis. I mean, it might be the national building code, or it could be NFPA, or it could be whatever. Yeah, some at least city, some yeah. city ordinance. Leaseholders are required to comply with all federal, state, and local laws, including code compliance. So, if their building was built to a certain code. They've got to meet that code. Obviously, the code changes, and you guys that are in the construction world know that you don't necessarily have to update your code stuff because the code changes if you've already were compliant when it's enabled. Some things you do. Some things you don't have a choice for. But, um, yeah, they have to be legally compliant. The one maintenance issue which gives me the most pause to thought for many of those lease, site, lease sites have to do with pilings, <clears throat> those that are supported in part or whole on piling because as we just touched on a little earlier um, and Gene would know I, I don't know about this and Gene probably does and you probably do Eric I mean if I if, if there's a bad pile does that automatically bring in the Coastal Commission no. oh no thanks Dana no 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 thanks I disagree oh sorry well, no. I, if, if you have to rep if you have to repair a piling, then you have to get at least a maintenance permit, and that has to be reviewed by the Coastal Commission, and they have to give you um, an administrative permit to do that. And if any, if either one of you have experience, or both of you have, how long does that take? I would generally say three months. It could be much quicker, but normally, if it's an emergency permit, you go ahead and get it get it done and then go apply for the permit, I believe. But normally, rule of thumb, I'd say two to three months for a maintenance permit. It's got to be scheduled with the Coastal Commission. You've got to talk to them, show them some plans, um, that sort of thing. So as it relates to those properties that involve a fair number of pile or any, any, any structurally significant piling, you might want to consider the five-year thing in, a, in that light. They, <clears throat> it depends on what they're made out of in the first place and how they're treated in the second place and some of them have a life expectancy of 25 years and some of them don't just as an observation I probably reviewed maybe 15 lease sites something like that and uh, maybe a few more um, and in the majority of them the pilings were all in pretty good shape we found a few that were rotted at the bottom, um, but and those can be repaired. But by far, most of them are still good in shape. Um, the pilings that are underneath, say, Harbor Hut and Gafco, all seem to be in pretty good shape. And they're, they've been there since World War II, or a little after. So um, they've got a lot of good cold creosotes. The treatment's probably a 40 psi. It's it's two or three inches thick of creosote. So. Those pilings seem to be okay. Which you can't get anymore. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Okay, and number six, uh, your number six, Eric, was implemented in FY 18, 19? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else we can do relative to C7? Mm, no. Eric, how would, you, how would you determine who goes to first first? I'm going to 
I'll buy a bingo wheel. <laughs> no, I'll qualify that. I think um, if there's if there's site, I mean, a place like, and I'll use maybe Anderson Inn or the Astero Inn. Re, Astero Landing, Astero Inn, redeveloped in the last five to seven years, new pilings, new structural, um, probably not a lot of major concerns there from a structural maintenance standpoint. Signage and compliance with other stuff is another issue. I'm not saying with that site, but that's a lesser of importance from a safety standpoint versus a site that um, is old and original, libertine, off the hook, something like that that's been there a long time and may, may warrant looking at the older sites first and doing it on the basis of age. How many of them have overwater improvements? No, almost everything. Almost all of them? I mean, some don't have pilings down into the water. Some have pilings into the revetment. But almost everything has something over. And, and how many sites water. is that, give or take? Is that 70 sites or 130 sites? Well, of our 30 lease sites, there's, I'm going to probably say, just eyeballing in my mind up and down the waterfront. I don't think there's, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't have something on the water. Either their building or slips or something like that over into the waters. Well, it's, it's the reason I asked the question is, as an initial stage, um, you can have if a, a if there is an appropriately qualified professional available to you, you could you can get a. We were talking about gut checks earlier on. You know, as far as cost allocation, you can get a gut check on those improvements that they spend. Uh, someone spends a couple of hours under each one of those, so we're talking about twenty, thirty grand, and that might help to develop some criteria as to the answer to the question of who goes who goes into lot one, lot two, and lot three. And as you pointed out, you don't have to do them all because some of them are are new, essentially new. Um, you, this is going to cost. You're right. This is going to cost money. Yes, you're right. The the Harbor Department needs, in my opinion, needs support for this on a professional support. And you're talking about some or magnitude of on the high end, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Gene, um, Eric, were you anticipating the entire lease site from the Embarcadero to the to the water? Or just just um, the water portion. Right, the whole site. Okay. I so mean, our the water portion. Um, it, it's been our policy, like I say, to inspect every five years. Most of our leases have language that says the tenant must periodically, and this is where I say the language isn't as strong as could be. The, the tenant must periodically inspect the water improvements. For needed maintenance and repairs, so it's on them to do the water stuff, and which right. is the things you were involved in. So on that aspect of it, which is probably the the hairier of the two issues from the from a wear and tear standpoint, as you say, it's on the tenant to do that. Ours would be more focused on. Uh, I would I would say our efforts would be more focused on the building itself and those improvements and and maybe go down to the water from a fire safety standpoint electrical that kind of thing make sure the standpipes are there make sure electrical looks good but leave it up to the leaseholders to do structural well, the reason i ask is you mentioned the ada requirements and that's a whole nother ball game so yep for what it's worth um we my wife and i have had and have commercial buildings in Morro Bay, and uh, I was thinking about we, we every one that we ever purchased, and some of them that we sold, we've had inspected with my qualified uh, commercial building inspector. Uh, Two thousand square feet was about five hundred bucks. Five thousand square feet is about fifteen hundred bucks. Now that has nothing to do with uh, with 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 over water. Yeah, with over water and stuff, but the build a building, and that that included you know all, all the functional aspects plus electrical. I I, rec 
when we hire somebody, I require that they be able to assess the electrical system as well. Okay, anything else on C7? Okay, all righty. So that brings us to declaration of future agenda items. Is there anything new? And by the way, the, the full list uh, is not just what's on this particular um, agenda for tonight. The full list also includes the items from the August, what were the minutes that we approved tonight? Those are the August minutes? August 3, August 2017. There's some additional items on that list. Anybody want to add anything tonight? Dean? Dana? Okay. Your motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? I'll second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries. Thank good you. Good job. Thank you. Keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good job.